Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat, episode 420, featuring a epic size interview with Brent Knowles. Uh, Brent was a uh, the lead director, create, uh, lead designer, creative director at Bioware for over 10 years. He's worked on everything from Baldur's Gate 2 to Neverwinter Nights uh, to Dragon Age Origins. He's written books, uh, books about the games industry as well as novels of uh, fantasy and science fiction. He's got a lot of uh, amazing uh, design, philosophical ideas, as well as practical suggestions here. A lot of behind the scenes stories about all those games I mentioned, uh, life at Bioware, and much, much more. It's really fantastic stuff. I know you're going to love every minute of it. So without further ado, here is Mr. Brent Knowles. All right, folks, I am here today with none other than the fabulous Brent Knowles. You probably know who he is, but just in case, he's a 10-year veteran at BioWare. He's been the lead designer and creative director on many projects that we're all really familiar with here at, at Mad Chat. Just mentioned some of the games he's worked on, uh, which include Baldur's Gate 2, Neverwinter Nights, and Dragon Age Origins. And I'm guessing you've played some of those. Uh, he's been at Beamdog. Are you, are you still there at Beamdog, Brent? Um, no, I actually left about six months ago. And um, I'm working at a technical college running a research group that does virtual reality, augmented reality, machine learning, and taking some of my uh, video game experience and applying it to uh, non-video game industry. Yeah, I, was, I guess as you said about six months ago, I was seeing on your blog you uh, had taken a trip to Iceland. Yes. I guess a little vacation, see some ice caves, you know... <laughs> You're from Canada, right? Is that right? Yeah, yeah, I know. It was kind of an unusual vacation for a yeah, Canadian. Yeah, like I'm a uh, Minnesota native. I wouldn't <laughs> want to go to Iceland for a vacation. I mean, give me Florida. Give me California. Yeah, I've done Florida before, and I really enjoyed it. Um, I was actually working out of Florida a few years ago, um, uh, doing contract work for a video game developer down there. And uh, did all the sites, brought my kids down there, saw all that. Um, they loved the warm weather. But yeah, Iceland for me... I read the sagas a long time ago, and I've always wanted to go and oh, see sure. the, the history of the place. And my kids thought it would be as fun as Disneyland, I guess, and tagged along with me. And uh, we did a lot of driving, and I showed them a lot of scenery. Um, and they enjoyed it. Uh, but it's a very pretty place. Um, lots of really inspiring mountains and glaciers and volcanoes. So, yeah, it was a fun trip. Yeah, volcanoes. That's not something I wouldn't normally think would, would be in Iceland. So I learned quite a bit from your your blog about that. Very nice photos. Oh, cool. Uh, so you, uh, I guess you're no longer obviously working on this uh, project of Axis and Allies online. Do you have any no. thoughts? Any th did you work on it before leaving? Oh yeah, no, for sure. Um, I was um, doing project director work on it for a, a year or so. Um, so yeah, heavily involved in it. Um, it's very fun. Um, I'm really excited to see it come out. Uh, it's, uh, yeah. Um, everybody, well, everybody in my group of friends loves the game, right? Oh, but sure. setting it up and going out and actually, um, playing it, finding people who want to play it just, it's really hard, right? But this, you, you set up a game in minutes and I was playing two or three games at the same time, right? Just it's turn base, right? So, oh, okay. My turn's up in this game. I'll, you know, throw a half hour at it here, half hour there, and uh, I've I played I don't know probably forty games I don't know uh, while I was doing development work on it right, and mm -hmm. so like order magnitude more games of the than the physical version than I've ever played in my life. Um, so yeah, it's very fun. Um, hoping to hear more news about it. Um, I haven't poked anybody that I know working at Beamdog to find out any status updates, but I'm um, sure it's chugging along. Yeah, you know, I should have written this down. I didn't write this down. Maybe you know. But I'm kind of curious when the original game came out. Oh, the year? Yeah. Um, was it before early D &D 80, Early 80s, wasn't it? Like very early 80s? Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. I'd have to go double check, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, I guess this is based on the second edition. 
Yeah, the, the rules being used in Access and Allies Online is, yeah, one of the newer additions that came out, um, I don't know, within the last 10 years, right? Kind of, they've refined the rules over over the years and um, made them a little bit more understandable. So um, the, the online edition is based on that. It sounds like Trent Oster's really excited about it, huh? <laughs> he's got some, apparently it's yes. his favorite game other than D&D. Yeah, no, he's he's a real big fan of it. And it was off a little uncomfortable sometimes because you're like, oh, I'm about to beat my boss at Axis and Allies. <laughs> uh oh, you're not uh, supposed to do that. <laughs> no, not supposed to do that. <laughs> Is it going to be a lot different than the uh, that Hasbro PC game? I think from, was it, late 90s? Um, I don't know about a lot different, um, and I haven't seen a lot's changed since I've left Beamdog um, on it. But they're like that was a fairly decent reproduction of the original board game, and I think the Beamdog version is going to be the same idea, like a, a good reproduction of the of the board game. Um, obviously, the visuals are going to look a lot different. The sound effects are going to look a lot different. Um, I did play a fair bit of that older version, right, um, for testing and just figuring out how they did things. And there are certainly things Beamdog um, are doing better than that old version. Um, <laughs> was a, like, I think it was 1998 is what I wrote down for that. So you know, there's been a few developments since then. You know? Yeah, a lot's, lots changed. Um, it was still playable, though. Um, so I, oh, did, yeah. I did play play it. Um, and get through a couple games and stuff so yeah but it's um the rules are complicated though even that game reading its um errata they had to simplify some of the rules right like they couldn't quite get everything right Mm -hmm. back then so yeah that's a topic i want to get more into (laughs) uh, throughout our chat today Uh, before we get into those though i wanted to talk a little bit about your your novels okay you know because this is i mean you've written quite a few uh, I guess fantasy and science fiction <clears throat> genres. I was looking at one called The Pool Arrival. And that one is, if I'm reading this right, that's going by some of the stuff on your website. It says that there's a sequel to it called The Pool Tower. Is that written yet? Or is that coming out soon? Or what's the status on that? Um, yeah, so writing has always been, like even before Dungeons & Dragons, I was writing. I was writing stories um grade four, grade five. Um, so that's always been my hobby, I guess. Um, so, um, yeah, I've written many short stories over the years, and then I was um, trying to write novels and get novels published, and uh, some of them I ended up self-publishing right through Amazon. Um, so, yeah, the sequel is written. Um, uh, I've actually got two other books in that series written in rough draft format as well. Um, but, yeah, I haven't done a lot of writing lately. Um, I've uh, kind of transitioning careers, um, uh, went through a divorce, right? So a lot of that stuff's been kind of back burner for me. Um, I haven't actually picked up writing in a little while, um, but uh, I am kind of looking at it again and going, yeah, I have, um, I think, six other novels written and not published as well. And I'm like, yeah, one day I'll get back to those. Um, I'd like to get the sequel to the pool out because it's kind of unfair to people who've read the first one and <laughs> i do have the second one mostly it's ready to go soon. i just want to do another proofread right but um there are, it's a lot of work right you don't want to put something out that's sloppy you want to write and who i am now is a little bit different than the person who finished the novel a while ago so i'd like to do another proofread and i'm sure i could find more things to improve so um sometimes that's my problem is i like to uh iterate on things uh maybe too long <laughs> until they're perfect, perfect, perfect. Uh, so, yeah. yeah, I'll try to get that out sometime. Oh, you know, an, my day job is an English professor, so I'm sorry. <laughs> what you're saying okay. really warms the heart, you know. <laughs> Pro- <laughs> the value of proofreading and taking your time, getting it right. Uh, just for people that might not know about this this book, I wanted to read a little bit of the description of it, and then there's a review posted on Amazon by Ron Sidwell. And this might seem a little off topic, you know, considering it's games, but I, I, it all comes together, believe me. Okay. <laughs> okay, so here's a little bit. Uh, this is from The Pool uh, Arrival, so I guess this is the synopsis. <clears throat> and I don't know if you wrote this, Brent, if this was uh, some, marketing, Wait, some marketing. It would it would be me in my marketing hat. Okay, yeah. this is uh, <laughs> Brent's marketing. Here we go. <laughs> Quote. When Miranda is forced by her mother and sisters to leave Earth and cross the universe to the middle of nowhere planet her family has owned for generations, she's beyond pissed. (laughs) Uh, She fears she will be stranded there forever, or at least the better part of her summer vacation. 
all because her grandmother decided to die. Really, no matter what century you live in, a teenager's life is never fair. <laughs> That's that's uh, fantastic. I mean, does it? You know, if somebody who's played the Baldur's Gate, Neverwinter Nights, all these games, you know, that's uh, it's a little bit surprising, I guess, you'd be writing a novel like this. So, <laughs> I mean, what is yeah. this? <clears throat> yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I um kind of write all kinds of things, right? Um, I, I definitely grew up from a background of you know exploring dungeons and epic plots and all that. Um, I always try to put a lot of personality and character into my campaigns even though right like so a lot oh, of personal absolutely. quests when i was doing the pen and paper um and so i i try to write personal stories with my um short stories and my novels just really having you know interesting characters and try to really get into them so yeah that was me you know trying to you know remember what it was like to be a teenager and and try to write something with um you know a, a character who had a good voice mm-hmm. um that i really enjoyed writing and reading and um yeah, so I don't like to do the same thing over and over again necessarily, right? Um, so I have I have a couple like total fantasy novels written that you know are sitting on my hard drive and they're you know crawling dungeons and all that. Um, but yeah, I try to write characters who are different than me. I try to do my research, try to tell that different story, but still with lots of action and adventure and uh, yeah, just throw different kinds of people into uh, you know more traditional adventure scenarios and see how they. Uh, how they cope and how much they whine about it, which is what, you know, she does a fair bit of it, but her character develops over the course of the novels as well. Yeah, it almost sounds like a sort of a young adult book. Oh, that. yeah, for sure. And when I wrote it, that was kind of maybe where I was trying to target that, right? Like, um, and I have other novels where I was trying to target over here or over there, but I think that was my attempt, yeah, at a young adult novel for sure. I said I, would, I wanted to read a little bit of a review uh, okay. About that book. So uh, I think, you know, he's talking about your books, but when I read it, I keep thinking about your games. Okay. You know, so here's what he says. This is Ron Sidwell, and this is posted on the Amazon page. So, quote, uh, As a rule, I have little patience for the pablum being passed off as science fiction today. <sighs> Amen. <laughs> 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 I could just stop it there. Let's see. Uh, because in, in, invariably there is an obviousness to an agenda or an inescapable element of contrivance that keeps the story from seeming real enough for me to suspend my disbelief. But with Brent, with your with your novel, I was pulled into the story and the characters within the first dozen paragraphs. This is the way the science fiction should be presented. No laborious explanations of otherworldly or unfamiliar elements that detract from the story. Instead, the world that Miranda enters into has a reality of its own that the reader never questions because it is always presented as if it were the way things are. The more you read, the more you want to know. Now, there's something in that, I think, that applies equally well to uh, role-playing games. <laughs> yeah, I would, I would definitely agree when it's done well, for sure, yeah. yeah instead of hitting people with that kind of brick wall of terms and different things, right? If you can just ease them into it and get them interested in the characters and the, and the story, right? The rest, they will, uh, they'll pick up as they go. It's hard to do though. Yeah. It must be. (laughs) And even when you know it's what you need to do, it's sometimes hard to convince everybody that it's the best approach or right. Especially when you're in team, team settings, right? Like everybody learns things differently. So you sometimes have to, uh, um, work with a group. And, and convince them. But yeah, I think when my writing is at its best, that's what I'm doing. Um, when it's at its worst, it, I'm doing the opposite. <laughs> so. Well, you know, I've played lots and lots of uh, computer role-playing games. And this, this is one of the things I I think uh, Ron here, is that this is his name, right, Ron? Yeah, puts. I think he gets it. I like the way he words all this. Because I notice with some games, I feel like I'm reading a lot of text. I don't really feel, I feel more like it's distracting me from the game or it's kind of superfluous somehow. It's Right. Like a word like flavor text, something like this. <clears throat> Whereas I play other games, I don't even know. I don't even feel like I'm reading. You know, it just feels like everything is designed to sort of get me into and, and keep me, give me more and more compelling reasons to explore uh, the characters. Uh, you know, everything kind of builds around a coherent uh, sense of right. immersion. It's, it's, I it's creating a world. It's it's, and you're just exploring it and happy to explore it. 
and yeah, and sometimes when you hit um, either text heavy or maybe even cinematic heavy stuff at times, um, I find for myself it pulls me out. Mm-hmm. And then you have to kind of reengage, get back into the <laughs> into the flow of things. Yeah, I kind of wonder sometimes if uh, <clears throat> maybe the games that I, you know, a lot of games I play, if you ask me afterward, like, what, well, what was the backstory? What was the big narrative there? And it would be more, mm. you know, I'd be telling you more about what my characters did. It'd feel more personal. Right. Uh, then you know, I think I sort of, <laughs> to put a judgment value on it, <laughs> lesser games, you know, there is, there might be more of a sense of, well, here's the story is laid out by the you know, the designer gods. <laughs> right. Uh, it's, but it's sort of one-size-fits-all experience for the players. Uh, whereas something like Baldur's Gate 2, or I would say Neverwinter Nights 2, uh, Neverwinter Nights, T-O-O. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> uh, it does feel more like this, uh, you know, like I'm building my world and I'm exploring, I'm, I'm building my story based on my own experiences in that world. And the world's a backdrop for you to do that personal story development yeah so i I definitely enjoy those games as well um i think story can be heavy-handed sometimes in video games but so we got lots of different types of games out there lots of different types of designers um so i guess it's like right now we're in a very interesting um gaming universe right there's so many different types of games that i think a lot of people can find the type of game that matches them best um uh but yeah no i certainly like exploration and you can make up your own story um, and that's something that a lot of – it's hard for a lot of writers to understand. Um, they uh, fill yes. in all the blanks, <laughs> right? And it's like um, – I think somewhere on, on my blog I talked about um, – was it a, a playing Oblivion? And um, I accidentally killed my horse. And it was just purely a gameplay thing. But I had crafted this entire story, and I, w- I was upset and feeling guilty and, and sad. And it, you know, the designers didn't do any of that. That was purely – Oh, I rode my horse off a cliff or something, I think, accidentally, because I was being reckless um, <laughs> and bad on me, right? So, um, yeah, um, I, I like games that allow you to do that as well, for sure. Well, Brett, you've got a lot to say about game design. <clears throat> for people who don't know this, uh, Brent has written over 500 pages. <laughs> Is that many? Okay. <laughs> That's a lot of pages, wow. Uh, uh, 500 pages on game design for the Lazy Designer book series, uh, which if hopefully uh, I, I tweeted about this the other day, but for folks who don't know about this, I, I put a link to uh, Brent's website so you can check out this collection. Uh, but it's an entire series of books of how-tos. It covers everything from personal task management, which I think, you know, that topic alone might be worthy of a, of a match chat, you know, but uh, on up to world building large-scale project management, and who, who, who do you want to learn this from? I mean, <laughs> you know, here's the guy. Uh, so I hope people pick those up. It's When I checked uh, before this video, I actually picked it up myself. I don't know if this oh, is a temporary appreciate special. appreciate that. Or, it's 30 bucks uh, as of uh, this recording. Uh, but I think that will definitely pay for itself, probably with that first book. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> with all that said, <laughs> I wanted to bring up so some really interesting passages I wanted to uh, discuss with you. I think it'll tie. It'll be a nice segue into the into the games. Okay, sounds good. Uh, so, let's see. Where does this start? This quote. Uh, so you're talking about yourself here, in the preface, and what kind of designer you are. And here's what you say: "Quote, I am a practical designer." And in my time with Bioware, I built high-quality video games in reasonable time frames and with reasonable resources. It sounds like there might be some... uh, Okay, (laughs) moving on. (laughs) This is not purely a design book either. It is a book about becoming a capable employee and an asset to your team and to the company. This is the part I really like. There are no shortcuts when creating great games, but you can improve your own skills by understanding how others, like myself, solve common problems in, in game development. So very lovely passage there, Brett. It's just kind of, am I wrong? I think, you know, I'm trying not to read between the lines too much here, but. Uh... <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know if there's a commentary. I'm sure I, I inject commentary without even thinking about it as I write. Um, I, I think you can make fun games with a reasonable sized team. And that was probably what I was trying to get at that. Um, um, I wrote these after leaving Bioware. 
um, and Bioware was a uh, Dragon Age Origins was a huge, huge um, yeah. g- game. I don't think the team. I think the team ended up maybe 200 people at, at a point. Um, I know I was managing 20, 30 people, directly designers, and then comparing that back to when I had started on Baldur's Gate 2, I think the entire company was only 50 people, right? So here here I was, you know, uh, several years later on a, a game where there were more designers under me than probably people worked on my first game, right? So I started to see the um, scale, how operations start to fail at scale, um, and it was harder and harder to... Uh, to kind of have every team member throw their creative creativity into the game. Baldur's Gate 2, I was like dropping my Dungeons & Dragons characters into dungeons and just being very creative and hands-on. And it's harder to do in larger teams where there's a lot of coordination, there's some middle management having to show up just because there's so many people, mm-hmm. right? You can't directly manage 30 people. So yeah, I maybe was talking a little bit about that, talking a little bit about um, maybe some of my aspirations. Um, you know, uh, intent on working at a smaller company, doing smaller projects, um, but being able to focus more on the actual gameplay and not on maybe the uh, management and paperwork side mm-hmm. of game development. Yeah, that is interesting. I mean, people that watch this show, <laughs> we were all kind of in love with the 90s era. Right. And, you know, a lot of people tell me, well, you know, Matt, the reason you don't like the latest AAA game, whatever it is, is you're, you're too old. You know, the, the, things have moved on. You know, but I, th- I think it for me it come, kind of comes back to what there's, there was something about those smaller teams and the creative energy, <clears throat> the creative spirit, the control that the smaller team had. It seems like that's more about what it was, right? Uh, than just having uh, the best possible 3D, uh, highest frame rate, blah blah blah. No, I, I would agree. I'm I, I certainly play AAA games now. I find my time is limited. To, I can't dive into the, the deep deep games that I used to. I, I try to actually avoid addic- games that I know I'll get addicted to. <laughs> I got kids to look after. I'm a single parent, and uh, you know I got to keep busy with them. Um, but so I do play triple games. I do appreciate them. But I'm yeah, I'm not a graphics person. Um, I'll definitely lean towards games that have character, um, right? Stylized art, um, simpler art. If the story and gameplay is good. Uh, so yeah. Um, I guess I, I understand that I grew up right on Sierra games, on Ultima games. When you have a smaller team, there's more of that personality of the developers showing up in the game, right? If you have a, a team of ten people, you're going to see personalities reflected in um, mm-hmm. how they design their gameplay systems. When you have a team of a hundred people, that is going to be diluted to a, to a degree. And I think that's maybe what you see sometimes in AAA games. Um, I definitely don't aim. I don't buy games based on their graphics. Um, I don't fault games based on their graphics usually, and that was one of my weaknesses, um, e- even at Bioware. Right, like I did have to rely on other people to say hey, that doesn't look competitive, Brent. I'm like, <laughs> that doesn't look competitive. <laughs> uh, um, it, it's fun. Was that the criticism? Uh, wow. Yeah, um, but yeah, I mean, some of my fondest game memories are still the Ultima series games. Um, certainly played many of them, and then the the Sierra, the different quest games. Right, and there's lots of personality in all of those games. Oh yeah, absolutely. You know, I've, I've got quite a few designers on, and that's seems to be one of the themes. I remember Tim Kane in particular stands out because uh, he was talking about the when they did Fallout One. Right. Uh, interplay was really not involved, and there was you see lots of their personality in, in that. But of course, later, uh, once it was, it was kind of a victim of its own success, I suppose. Yeah, and it's inevitable, I guess, which is maybe sad. <laughs> but but yeah, it's nice to see. Game, um, we have a lot of games like that nowadays too. Right? It was the indie okay. games, and that, that was hard to find those games maybe at times. But there's a lot of personality games out there. Oh, again, sure. yeah, Serpent uh, in the Staglands comes to mind. I don't know if you've seen that one, but no, no, I I, I rely on my ch- children to tell me <laughs> what to check out. What's what's new and hot nowadays? How, how old are your kids? If you don't mind my. I, I have a 13-year-old boy and an 11-year-old boy. Oh, um, perfect and, age uh, for good 90s. Yeah. yeah I find myself <laughs> you got them playing right Baldur's Gate? <laughs> uh, they have definitely checked out the Baldur's Gate games and, and all that. Um, they're more into competitive shooters. And, uh, you know, they've gotten me into 
uh, Titanfall and mm-hmm. Apex Legends and uh, Fortnite. Um, so that you know, they play a lot of those. Um, they have definitely fired up Baldur's Gate. They fired up Planescape Torment. Uh, oh, they played around Neverwinter Nights nice a little bit. Um, so you must be really yeah. proud when that. <laughs> you know, they're not as enthusiastic about it as oh. I would. <laughs> Your dad worked on that. <laughs> yeah, whatever. Did you see this? Oh, new well, my dad <laughs> worked <laughs> on it. Yeah. Yeah, um, um, but uh, yeah, they played a few games of Axis and Allies online with me as well. So um, oh, I definitely uh, I use them as play testers when I am. <laughs> That's fantastic. Uh, here's another little quote from this Lazy Designer series I really like. And this is I think this is almost a philosophical like position of yours. I think it, it was in a little section called Design Philosophy, if I recall correctly. But <laughs> anyway, here it goes. As much as I would love to proclaim myself the final word on all things game design, especially in regards to role-playing games, that would be silly. The truth is that all of our rules and preferences, whether as developers or players, can always be proven wrong. There is no right way. (laughs) I mean, I agree in principle, but what does that mean for game Um, design? I think for me, it's the game as a whole that matters. So even if there's an individual game system that could have been done better, or like if we had, you know, looked at this competitor and did it their way or whatever, um, which is something that um, does happen in game development companies, right? Like there's a lot of talk about, hey, these guys are doing this, these guys are doing that. I think it's important for somebody and hopefully some buddies on teams to have a cohesive view of what the game should be. And make sure every system works well in that. And every story, like every character, all that, like it should fit together in a way that doesn't seem jarring or added on. Um, I don't remember. I wrote that passage a long time ago. I probably was thinking of something in particular. <laughs> um, I don't remember what that would be. I could speculate. Um, but um, sometimes you can get so fixated on making like one system super perfect or, or whatever that you then neglect other aspects of the game or even you make it so different from the rest of the game it might be good in and of itself but it it's not the right system for this game that you're working on um and also just probably for me to remind myself at times too like um you can get into a pattern um i know at bioware we joked sometimes like i was the person giving all the answers right so even if i wasn't working on somebody's project i'd have team members come in and ask me questions and it's like oh yeah brent knows the right answer but i i didn't right like i was wrong um uh if mass effect had done things exactly the way i suggested when i was talking to their leads at lunch um it probably wouldn't have been as good of a game right because i had my entrenched views on what an RPG had to be. And if you didn't do it, it would be wrong. And if they had only done my stuff half-heartedly, right, it would have been a bad game, right? They, okay, they had to do okay. The, they, what, what did you tell them to do? <laughs> oh, not, nothing. Um, I'm trying to even remember specifically. <laughs> you definitely should have that ending, <laughs> for one thing. <laughs> I, and again, I never played Mass Effect 3, yes, I'm talking about the, the ending thing, but okay. I did write a, a more general blog post about how i would have ended a science <laughs> yes. trilogy um which also caused a little bit of a yeah uh, a stir uh but yeah i never actually played mass effect 2 or 3 i did play one and i enjoyed one i think mass effect 2 they were moving away from an inventory system and i think i had some concerns with that i if i'm remembering one of the specific lunch discussions i had i was like you can't do that it's an RPG. You have to have uh, inventory systems, uh, you know, traditional inventory mm-hmm. systems. And I think they steered um, away from that. So that's probably terrible, a terrible mistake. Terrible mistake. <laughs> well, it's hard to say, but I think Mass Effect 2 is considered one of the best games. So then, right, like different audience, right? Um, yeah, well, I did, maybe, yeah. And I think that's what was happening. Bioware was growing a different audience over time. And for some of the veterans like me, that was harder because I was like, well, I'm, I'm more akin to this other audience over here that we're not catering to as much anymore, right? Um, uh, I mean, there's people who play Bioware games right now who don't know anything. The Matt Bartons of the world. (laughs) Perhaps, yeah. Yeah, like, like I definitely grew up in a pen and paper world, and I liked developing games that felt like pen and paper, and Bioware has moved into a much more cinematic universe. And they sell well, and... I don't know. I think they do well. So I, um, so it's, it's working for them, but it was definitely not um, what I enjoyed most when I played games. Yeah, speaking of what you do enjoy the most, one last... Uh, actually, I might have another quote. I might be lying. 
<laughs> this is uh, this is another quote for this book, and I think you just kind of nail for me what makes Baldur's Gate two, which is my, that's my favorite computer role playing game. Okay, yeah. very cool. You know, I, I like Neverwinter Nights and Dragon Age Origins, so no, no I don't want to diss those games, but right. uh, for me, it's <laughs> Baldur's Gate two. Baldur's Gate two, and so there's a quote for this book. That, then I think this really gets at what makes Baldur's Gate two the game that it is, right? And so this is what you say. The games I enjoy are balanced. That is, they have a story, exploration, role system progression, and engaging combat. When a game focuses too much attention on one or two elements at the expense of others, I lose interest. You know, I feel like we're on the same wavelength here. <laughs> I mean, you put it much better than I ever could, but... So we got story, exploration, rule system progression, and engaging combat. I mean, you make it sound easy. Just balance them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, and it it's definitely a challenge. Um, but yeah, those are the games that, you know, like that's what I wanted to make, and that's what I wanted to play, and that's what I grew up playing in large part, and that's how I ran my Dungeons & Dragons campaigns, right? Trying to have all those factors given equal weight. I mean, there wasn't like an Excel sheet where I was balancing. Like, <laughs> um, Got but, weight, um, weight, weighted grades. <laughs> I do think many of us at the time um, tried to pay attention to it. So um, I worked a lot with James Olin, who is uh, now doing his Arcanum World stuff. I don't know if you've heard any of that, but he's creating pen and paper books. And, and I learned a lot from him. So he was my manager over the years about trying to balance those aspects mm -hmm. um, because if it's all story, then it's going to appeal to people who are really only into all story. <laughs> and if it's all combat, right, then you, you've got a, a different demographic. But when you balance it well, the people who like story more than anything are still going to enjoy the game, right? A lot of people really like Baldur's Gate 2. And they come from a wide variety of gaming backgrounds, right? Um, yeah, exactly. It, they, they may not have enjoyed the combat as much or they struggled with some of the harder combat. But they're there for the story and the combat is nice Um pacing right because when you have different systems you're kind of always doing something as a player you're like okay i'm in a conversation oh it's just the right length great now i'm off on some combat mission i'm exploring a dungeon right you're always getting a, a little bit of all these cool things to do um instead of it's just being like okay another 30 click dialogue another <laughs> 30 click minute dialogue. Cinematic, um <laughs> right um yeah but it's really hard to balance and especially as teams grow larger um, to keep that same feel everywhere. And I think Baldur's Gate 2 did many things wrong. Um, it, it's also one of wrong. my favorite games. <laughs> I think I think I would like to, you know, try making a game like it, but a little bit different um, someday in the future. Uh, uh, I think some of the conversations um, were long, um, and there could have been more focus at times. But, you know, it was a fun game to work on. And it was a super fun game to play. We used to, like, we do QA ourselves, right? Because Bioware didn't have a full QA team at the time. And I don't know how many times I played Baldur's Gate um, too. <laughs> and it's a long game. Uh, right? yeah, we did speed run. Long. We did cheat. Like, we had cheat swords and spells and stuff so we could run through it fast. I think James was able to do it in an hour, if I remember correctly. I, I could uh, be with just, you know. Infinite power or something yeah and you just try to test all the different story paths because that was the nice thing about the game and the bad thing um is there are so many paths through everything um uh, i scripted the underdark portion and i was oh, a yeah. brand new designer um that was your first I, you said that you're a brand new designer when you did that i got to ease into it a little bit i was doing data entry so the, it was a really tough job it, like i had a monster manual book open my desk and i was typing monster stats and that was what i was doing initially um and then i started putting plots together um and i printed out um it's hard to explain uh with words but uh, a connection diagram of all the dialogue in the underdark and it was just pages and pages and it was this huge mess of spaghetti and i was like oh wow i have to like make this all work um and that was david gator um who had i'm pretty sure he wrote most of those plots and they were but i was new and I was told to make it work, and so I made it work. But the older me might have might have pushed back and said, "Could we simplify it a little bit, right?" But I was naive, and I was like, "Let's just do it." The writer wants it done, so did it. Um, and that was also something with the early teams, right? We maybe didn't know better sometimes, 
and we tackled things. That well, that's a lot of people consider that the, the best expansion. I mean, even you know, substantially better than the original campaign. Well, and I would definitely agree. Yeah, definitely agree with that. Um, but we we had a lot of freedom on it as well. Um, I, I sometimes joke, and it wasn't really joking, is I probably um, had more influence on Baldur's Gate 2 as a new designer than I did on Dragon Age Origins as Elite. Um, because it was like, Baldur's Gate 2, we got some empty dungeons, Brent. You got put some stuff in it? <laughs> sure, I've got all these old campaign ideas. and Right? So, um, you know, we, we just filled those dungeons. Um, and obviously we had the leads making sure things weren't ridiculous or complete. But I mean, I do have some things that I would consider ridiculous placed here and there in dungeons, right? I have a, a minotaur hero dying in battle. And that was like my friend's character from Dungeons and Dragons. We were doing a mm-hmm. Kryn campaign, right? So I just yanked his character out of my pen and paper campaign. And he arbitrarily you see him die um, fighting um, some Iconids, I believe, correct? And, but there's no story there. There's just mystery mystery what's this about um so we did a lot of that and it was fun um it, it was like building your own campaigns um and i think that's maybe why the overall flavor mm-hmm. of Baldur's Gate 2 is what it is because all of us were doing that yeah that's a perfect example too of what you're talking about earlier just the small team getting more of your personality your quirks or whatever into the game and i know uh, lord british obviously did a lot of that too with his uh he's one of your role models apparently yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, I definitely um, played many of his games, and I, I loved the personality. Right, you could. I think at the time I probably didn't realize that's what was happening. Now I'm older, I can look back and go, like, "You're seeing reflections of him, right, in the in the game, his quirks and his and and that's harder to get in the AAA games." And so when we're playing your games, is it what what <laughs> what should trigger us to think, "Oh, there's there's Brett," you know, this is some of him. <laughs> Oh, I don't. I think it'd be pretty random because it wasn't always me either, right? It would be like the friend I played Dungeons and Dragons with, right? That thing he did, right? And I'd put that in, right? Because I remember that being funny or, or whatever. So, yeah, I think it's hard to say. I I did some things that I believe I put a puzzle in uh, the second Neverwinter Nights expansion, Hordes of the Underdark, which made the rest of the team not happy with me. That was maybe too much Brent. Um, I. I made a text-based puzzle in the dialogue system. You have to, like, align a bunch of dots or something to unlock some bridge. I don't even remember the details. I just remember... You know, the time this is they, coming back to me. <laughs> they, complained, they complained about it at the time, and then on the forums, they all threw me under the bus. What were they when, complaining when, about it? Well, just that it was very obscure and weird. Um, and uh, But it was like, I had played games like that when I was growing up, and I was like, sure, that could be the system for controlling... I think it was a bridge um, that uh, in, in the Underdark. So... Yeah, I'd have to go surf on the forums to remind myself of um, that. That's a weird thing um, because it's been so many years. um, When Beamdog was working on the Enhanced Edition for Neverwinter Nights, um, I didn't really have any involvement in it, but I was watching the testers play, and I was watching them the one day. I was like, well, that looks really cool. Like, what is that? Like, I knew it was Neverwinter Nights, but I didn't know what part of Neverwinter Nights. And they're like, "Uh, this is Hordes of the Underdark, the one that you (laughs) were Oh, oh, no. oh, okay, yeah, and I watched it for a bit. I was like, oh, yeah. Well, I was, was just cool. testing you. <laughs> yeah, of course I remember everything. Uh, uh, but yeah, I mean, uh, I've worked on a lot of games, right? So the specific moments in the games, you know, I can get reminded of it, but they're not always um, foremost in my in my mind. All right, well, one last thing from this, this book series before we move on. Like I said, I think we could easily have spent the entire interview just talking about this, but... You know, one of the things, you know, I wrote I wrote a couple books on computer role-playing games. And one of the things I had to keep coming back to is the idea of the, the world that you're creating and the, and the realism. You know, how realistic do you want it? And you see a lot of the, including uh, Ultima games, where they make a big to-do about what will have day and night right. <laughs> cycles. And that's a, supposedly a big deal. But, but you have a slightly different take on it. I thought I would read a little bit of your position. I said, yeah, specifically talking about this business. I'm just using the night-day cycle as an example, but, you know, there's many similar issues. Uh, So you say, uh, in a game with no day-night cycle, I can handle them standing, talking about NPCs. (laughs) I can handle the NPCs just standing around. I just imagine that I'm always arriving to the area during the day when they would be standing there. <laughs> <laughs> it is about perspective. I mean, that seems really a... There, there's some definitely some wisdom here in this. Thought. Right. I wonder if you could kind of elaborate on this a little bit, because I know a lot of people watch this show, they're designing, they're, they're trying to design their own RPGs. 
Right. This issue comes up all the time, right? How realistic? What's the trade off? Yeah, I can. I mean, you make the right system for your game, like for sure. Like that's important. And sometimes you do have to do the the trade off on it not being realistic. I'm a very forgiven giving um, game player and game designer, right? So I will always like take the game for what it is um and in the context of that it's just yeah like for me it's like yeah i did arrive during the day like right like like you get to kind of decide to play the role and you're playing the role and then my imagination will work hard to fill in the details Mm -hmm. and um i don't know if there's really advice i can give to other people because but i think many players will do that so as a game designer you can rely on your players to fill in the blanks. Not all players will. Some players will be very unhappy that there's not a day and night, <laughs> night cycle, and you just can't do that. But, Who like, many cares? will. <laughs> you give them enough carrots, I guess, right? Mm-hmm. And you make what you have be believable and consistent, right? And then the parts that are not, um, hopefully your forgiving players will just write that part themselves. Um, and that's sometimes even with explanation, right? You don't have to explain every fact of a plot especially if it's not like super important right they can fill in some of that themselves um hey, right so man, i think we need to put two, that on a poster somewhere <laughs> that's a t-shirt like yeah two <laughs> lines of dialogue can sometimes you know fill in for five lines of dialogue or you know maybe a journal entry that's too verbose or or whatever yeah um but it is a hard thing because then sometimes right some designers take it the other way and then you get no information at all about anything and um and if that's the type of game they're making totally and completely that's okay but if they're trying to make a game that's more accessible then Mm -hmm. it doesn't work all that for them as well i mean in my experience it always just proves more annoying than anything else you're like i'm supposed to go talk to this guy then you get all the way there and it's like well the office is closed today come back tomorrow and you're like okay what what time is this what it doesn't make it more fun it's just yeah, maybe it's the, more realistic, but, you know, if I wanted realistic, I'd walk outside, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, and, and even, like, I know the older games uh, had a lot of eating and stuff that you had oh, to do, yeah. too, right? And Lighting and food. Yeah. And, you kind of wonder why they don't go to the bathroom, though. Right? <laughs> well, and I'm sure there were probably meetings where people wanted that. <laughs> Somebody did win an argument, I would hope. <laughs> That's going too far. Um, and uh, But, yeah, it it can be annoying, and then what happens is, people will create designers will create systems in a day night system to make the day night system less inconvenient right and then you start adding another system and another system right like oh maybe you can pick what time of day you arrive at an area and it's like well yeah then then you're kind of doing what i suggested initially anyway it's just you're arriving a day all the time right um so yeah you start getting a system on top of system on top of system Mm -hmm. um but i do think there are probably great games that do well with a day night system but the entire game should be designed around around that and make that fun and and interesting um uh you know the Baldur's Gate 2 right had some day night right I don't know if we did as much with it as we could have right but um yeah I think you have to go all the way if you're going to do it you're going to have to make it there's interesting things to see at one o'clock in the morning (laughs) just go to Walmart (laughs) of the game right Which, which then is a huge cost so yeah, I saw a discussion about this in another game. Uh, where they were this, this person was uh, kvetching about waypoints or the lack thereof, and talking about how boring it is to travel, you know, from point A to point B in some of these games. And you know, I don't know. Maybe I get your opinion on this. Uh, I mean, I guess it does kind of make it give you more of a feel like this is a massive world. I mean, look how long it takes to get all the way right. to this other town, but. Somehow it just doesn't, you know, yeah, you can click, it's more convenient, but it is something just kind of bothers me about it. I can't pin it down. It's tough in every, I mean, every game, again, there's no right or wrong, right? Every game has to do their own own thing. Um, I know at where I'm at in life, right, being busy, it's hard for me to play a game where, you know, I'm doing 30 minutes of click, 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 <laughs> click, right, to move across a map or something like that, right? So I do appreciate a fast travel system. Um but on the other hand, you shouldn't be making all games for me. I would imagine there are younger people with more patience who would love some of these games that you know, like that you and I maybe played growing up. I bet you they would enjoy some of those gameplay elements, right? Um, a teenager has a lot of time on their hand, and um, I know <laughs> I did, <laughs> right? And I, I was able to sit there and play a lot of these games that you know had, I think, what would be considered monotonous systems nowadays. Um, but I enjoyed them at the time. 
Yeah, that uh, amazes me too. You go back and play some of these games, and you're like, I don't remember this ever bothering me at all. Right, and it probably but, didn't, and it probably felt perfectly natural, right? Just because that was time was different for us at that moment in our lives. All right, so here's a question for you, Brent, from Mache Duraj. Hope I'm pronouncing that right. It's a good question, I think. So he says, what inspired you to get into Dungeons and Dragons and fantasy to begin with? Oh, wow. That's, that'll, take, that'll take you back. <laughs> that's a very long time ago. Um, I'd like to, I think it was around like grade five. I saw older kids playing Dungeons and Dragons in a library. And I was like, well, that looks cool. But I had no idea that there were books you had to buy. So I went home. And I remember recruiting my cousins to help me, and we invented Dungeons and Dragons based on me watching what these other kids had been doing. So I drew maps, I made up some rules. Um, I think I went. You had made up your own rules. I made up my own rules one weekend, and we played a fake Dungeons and Dragons. Um, and then shortly <laughs> thereafter, somebody informed me that no, there's like you can go to the department store and buy books. Um, I was like, oh, okay. So yeah, I just started um, buying them, and this is kind of a cool. I mean, moment in my life, obviously, we live in a different universe nowadays, but um, every week, there might be new modules um, showing up at the department store. So I'd go and I would, <laughs> oh, my goodness, okay, I got to save my money up for this one. And oh, we don't have a complete series of modules. So I'm going to have to go and try to go to the town next door <laughs> to find them. So yeah, I just kind of really got into that ecosystem. Mm -hmm. um, but we ran out of stuff to play pretty rapidly. Um, and I think I we rotated dungeon dungeon masters, but I just kind of I often became the de facto dungeon master, and I just really enjoyed making up stories. Um, and I was writing um, already, writing little short stories, um, which is something I kind of did all my life. Um, and they fed each other, right? Like I'd have a cool story idea, then I'd think about how I could turn that into, you know, an adventure in the campaign or an aspect of the campaign. Um, yeah, and I played D and D all through high school and. At a point, it got very popular when the Crin novels came out, uh, the Dragonlance oh, yeah. novels, oh, and all of a sudden, I believe I was running two or three sessions, like two diff like different campaigns, because everybody was into Dungeons and Dragons. Um, yeah, no, I just like the, uh, I like the social aspect, right? The the hanging out with friends, and then the storytelling aspect. Um, and certainly some of my leadership qualities probably came out by certainly like telling people what to do as well, and uh, guiding a group of people through an experience was fun. Um, and then that obviously led into the video game aspect, right? Where you could, instead of having to go to each person's house <laughs> and assemble a group of five people to play, I could uh, just build something and then send it off to people and they would all play it. Yeah, it seems like your Dungeon Master experience was key, really. In... Yeah, it was actually a recruiting tool, right? Like, Or when we were interviewing at Bioware, like for the f first three years, um, mm -hmm. You had a much Let me see your chance. character sheet. <laughs> well, it's higher chance of getting a job if you Part had been resume. a dungeon master. Like, regardless of whether you're a designer or a writer, um, just knowing that you had been able to like manage a group, you know, tell a story, a consistent story. Um, the the original um, kind of crew at Bioware, right? It was like a uh, the, a Dungeons and Dragons group in um, Grand Prairie, which is north of Edmonton, where Bioware was situated. They all kind of went together and joined Bioware in those early days predating me. Um, and it showed a lot in the flavor of the games they made. So, yeah, I think the Dungeon Master part had a huge influence. But I think nowadays, um, well, actually, Dungeons & Dragons is much more popular. So actually, probably nowadays, everybody does play. But there was a point in time at Bioware where it's hard to find people who, what are you talking about? What's Dungeons & Dragons? Oh, get out of town. Like, what? No, you never <laughs> played? What the? Uh, and that's, and trying... that's probably the point where, pew, <laughs> well, uh, I mean, definitely changes would happen for sure. Yeah, um, but yeah, no, it was um, uh, lots of people played Dungeons and Dragons at, at Bioware, so it was a uh, a big part of the experience. You play with your kids? Um, I do. Uh, I definitely took a big hiatus, like you know, being married and everything. I I ran a few sessions for friends here in the city. Um, this isn't where I'm from though. I'm from elsewhere, right? So I didn't have my D and D group with me here when I moved. To Edmonton. Um, so I uh, played several years with some friends here, um, stopped for several years. My kids got old enough, bought the fifth edition starter. Actually, I didn't buy it. I was given it by a coworker, and I ran them through that starter campaign for the fifth edition. And now my 13 year old um, runs his own campaign. <laughs> awesome. 
and I, I, have and a I, play, about... I, I play a silent character who doesn't speak um, so that <laughs> they, does that work? they do their own thing. I'm just there to chaperone <laughs> the experience um, and help him learn to be a better dungeon master. Somebody had asked me, I'm trying to find the question here so I can credit them, but <clears throat> uh, not seeing it. Han- yeah, here it is. Bob Ert. Uh, so he was. He did ask what you thought about the fifth edition. Okay, um, I wouldn't be able to say I was, I'm an expert in the way I was at one time on the uh, second edition. Like that was what I grew Is up. Is that your favorite, the second edition? Um, I wouldn't say it's the favorite, but it's what I grew up on. Um, I, I definitely agree it's complicated, and, <laughs> and there's a lot of exceptions. And but I mean, it's the thing I'll always have nostalgia value for, right? Um, but um, I think the fifth edition rules have a decent balance of complexity versus you know accessibility um the kids really like it um i think there's a lot of like do you really all need to be dragonborn uh, <laughs> but, uh right like yeah. they gravitate to the coolest looking right the um things or the the power gaming things so i've been trying to teach them you know having a weak character is kind of cool um, but they don't believe me. Yeah, how does that go over? <laughs> yeah, they, they don't. Um, and I'm sure I was probably the same. Um, but yeah, no, I, I enjoy the, the fifth edition. It's, it's, it's fun to play. Um, it's uh, And I've kind of been recruiting more people into playing it. It's been pretty easy to get them into it. Um, I played a fair bit of third as well. Um, so that was when I was running some of my um, campaigns with friends here in the city. And I enjoyed that too. Um, that was partly homework. Right for for some of the games that are being made at Bioware, um, uh, and uh, I never played the fourth, so I have no experience with the fourth edition. I've read lots about it. All right, well, let's get into your early days at Bioware. And one of the things you said is, uh, I think this was a two thousand back in two thousand and nine. You, you said that I'm not the same person I was when I started. And Bioware isn't the same company. So that was 2009. Right. So I'm thinking back when you, what was it like when you started there? <laughs> what, what were you like and what was Bioware like? Kind of got into a little bit already with the, you know, Dungeons right. and Dragons group and sounded almost more like a group of buddies than anything else. But but you, I want to hear your description. Yeah. No, I definitely think when I started at Bioware, um, I had just finished my university degree um, I'd still be going home for most summers. I was still playing D&D fairly regularly. So for the the me part, right, I was still very much immersed in that Dungeons & Dragons ecosystem. Um, I was still trying to write write um, for Dragon and, and for other gaming magazines. Um, and then starting at Bioware, small group, um, they just went through, uh, you know, they made Baldur's Gate 1. Um, and that had been, a you know, a big crunch time journey for them, right? So there was a lot of camaraderie between them. Um, which is something I would experience <clears throat> several times over at Bioware. Like working long hours with each other, I, I know like the industry is really bad for this. Um, in the early days, though, it was it was fun. Um, I don't think my wife at the time thought it was probably as much fun as I did. But it was a lot, a lot like of being, long nights again. Yeah, a lot like being in university though. Like you're up late, you're having these cool conversations, you're adding fun stuff to the game, um, right? So there's a lot of that. So a lot of bonding in those early years, hanging out with people. Um, having those cool conversations, um, spending all our entire day talking about D and D, right? But being paid for it, that was pretty exciting. That was like, you know, oh, could this character beat this character, um, right? Like having those kinds of discussions in the hallway, or um, you know, getting feedback like, okay, the mind flayers are are too much, too realistic. They're too dangerous. They're wiping everybody out. Make the mind flayers weak. Okay, fine. If you make me, I'll make the mind flayers weaker because you know the, the game has to be play, playable past this point. Um, so yeah, it was really fun, really immersed in that culture, right? For those first few years, um, and it was a lot of problem solving, which I do enjoy. Um, I don't enjoy puzzle games, um, which some people make that mistake. Brent loves solving puzzles. Let's give him puzzle games. Nope. Um, but what I like is solving tangible problems, like whether it's a workflow problem, like. Um, you know, I was able to help make the scripting more efficient on Baldur's Gate 2 so we could do more, right, by developing a couple tools or even helping the pipeline. Um, and uh, other uh, team members definitely contributed to that kind of problem-solving thing over time, right? And it was fun. It was fun sitting down going, like, you're not going to be able to make the plot this way, 
right? I, unless we get the programmers to, you know, spend a week adding some features for you, or we come up with a creative solution. And then we'd often the creative solution we found, um, even though we were frustrated at having to find it, it, it made the game so much better, right? And again, I, I, I struggle for examples, but it happened all the time. It's like we'd walk out of a meeting, we'd start frustrated, like, oh, we got to change everything because of whatever. And we'd walk out going, oh, the game's so much better now. Um, and there's lots of that stuff. Um, and even in the early days, um, I, I don't think I'd been there very long when we started talking about this, you know, the potential of a Star Wars game, right? So, so how cool is that as well to be in these conversations about maybe being able to make a Star Wars game and what would that plot would look like and and all that. So it's like pure geek fun land. Um, well, that's the kind of that's the kind of uh, fertile environment you want, I think, to make great games, right? The... Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Very, very creative. Um, um, even when we disagreed, right, we still got along, right? Everybody was kind of no helping each other. <laughs> yeah. So, so it sounds yeah. like kind of early on you took on this persona of the answer man. Maybe, yeah, maybe it was starting to develop. Um, certainly not my first. I think I write a bit about this in one of the books or my blogs. Um, I had a rough start, though, um, because I'd come in with a computer science degree and I wrote. So it was assumed that I would be able to write every plot and script every plot myself, and it would be amazing. Uh, but writing nonlinear dialogue is actually really hard. And so I had a skill set for writing fiction, like short story mm -hmm. linear fiction, um, but not a skill set for nonlinear. And that was hit and miss throughout Bioware's career. You bring in a novelist who wasn't able to do it. So I, yeah, I definitely struggled. And I also struggled with, uh, I was young and eager, and I was always um, over promising things. I was, and then getting behind. And so I, I think my first employer review was bad. I think oh. I had like, pretty much like, <laughs> Brent, you got to get your stuff together here and, uh, um, and improve. And that was a, definitely a wake up call for me to kind of, even become a bit more practical, a little bit more organized, right? So I really, um, I guess, leveled up and nice. uh, applied a bit more rigor to what I was doing. Um, definitely reached out and tried to help other team members more as well because I knew I had some thoughts and skills there that would help their workflow. And I started being more, um, communicate more with them. And uh, and and I learned to uh, um, under-promise and over-deliver. <laughs> Right, and, was and Scotty that, from Star Trek with a line like that. Uh, yeah, he definitely. Um, and some people see it as well. Then you're just not doing as much as you should. But it wasn't like that. It was I was really bad for over promising. Like ah, I can do all this, right? So I had to really sit back and go, what can I get done? And then I say a little bit less. Get four characters done for you this week. Okay, I can get three done for you this week, and then I give them five, right? And then you know, okay, hey, look at Brent, he's awesome. Um, so there's some illusion going on there, I think, a little bit. Um, but it is good. It's good to be realistic. Um, okay. So I do. You say it's better to underpromise and overdeliver than the <laughs> vice versa. Then. Yeah, because the other thing um, creates disappointment, right? right. Like if, if as a manager, and I've been a manager longer in my, my career than I've not been a manager, it was very frustrating to have to adjust tasks and timelines right and all those kind of things i and I, I always took what they said with a grain of salt and i would compensate for that in the schedule but um you know you don't want to have to constantly be changing your plans because the team mm -hmm. is constantly getting behind right it's, it's better to um live in a more realistic world um and if you happen to get ahead then you all look like awesome superstars um so that was advice i often gave everybody i was like i, I know you're trying to be helpful here but why don't we do less this week? You, you're going to promise less this week. And then they feel good at the end of that, right? Because they're not feeling like they're always falling behind. So, yeah, definitely advice for most people is um, be realistic. That seems like really good advice, just <laughs> life advice, really. But, you know, you're talking about performance reviews. You know, I'm trying to picture, like, what was Bioware like? So, I mean, is it kind of like this group of buddies that are – geeking out all the time but then there's like the super formal <laughs> performance review i mean like how businessy <laughs> for lack of a better word or professional um, uh was this environment yeah it was businessy enough i guess um i think there were periods of time where it got too businessy and that wasn't i won't say that's just because of electronic arts or anything I think there were moments where maybe our employee review forms got a little bit too long and a little bit too cumbersome to have to fill in as a manager for everybody. Um, but Bioware was always trying to try different things out, right? Um, they definitely wanted employees happy and engaged and were willing to try different methods of doing it. Sometimes you go down the wrong path of 
yeah, that's way too many forms to fill in. I've got 10 people I'm managing and I have to, nope. Um, <clears throat> so it was fairly informal. Um, we always tried to make sure we had some critique, like something concrete somebody could take away from the review that they could improve. Um, so, you know, if I had learned something interesting, I would try to like encourage some of my team members to learn that my managers would do the same. So we tried to make it useful without it being too heavy, heavy handed. Um, sometimes we didn't succeed at that. Um, but yeah, it, it wasn't like super, we weren't all in suits or anything and it wasn't like, <laughs> yeah, it, yeah, yeah, it was all about helping each other. Imagine better. like this. You ever seen Office Space, the movie? Um, actually, I haven't seen Office Space, but I've seen some scenarios where. And yeah, sure. um, yeah. remember the boss in that? Was it? Was it anything like that? I... No, no, we kept it pretty low key. Like we, we were all. So what was the most useful thing other? you ever got on your performance review? Useful? Oh, sh <laughs> <laughs> now you're challenging me to. Um... I just wonder if was there one piece of advice that was like, wow, that's. Yeah, That's you know, I don't completely change my view I don't on really, I dig through some interesting things happen. I don't know if they were super useful, but maybe they made me think about um, things a bit differently. On one of the projects, I was having some uh, challenges with the art department. Um, some challenges <laughs> in that uh, <laughs> they weren't on the same page as me, right? Um, mm -hmm. And from my point of view, you know, I was in the right, um, but my manager did something interesting, and I don't know if this was successful or not, but it was interesting, in that I got paired with one of the artists. Um, so our reviews, our next review was a tandem review, um, so we both had to work together. Like a buddy to, cop movie. So. <laughs> it, was, it was effectively a buddy cop movie where, yeah, we would work together a lot more. I would communicate more of, you know, like my practical skills and my experience. Um, and I would at the same time learn a bit more about the art process, mm -hmm. what inspired them, what what made them want to work in the game industry, right? Um, so I thought that was interesting. Um, I don't know. I never did that, I think, to anybody as a manager. Um, but I think it was a useful experience. I definitely did become closer to the artists, understand their process a, a bit better. And uh, we uh, butted heads a little bit less often and so yeah a little bit <laughs> <laughs> so maybe useful all right there's some, something else i wanted to to uh to ping off you we were talking a little bit earlier about the fifth edition okay you know sort of what you thought about the rules and we talked about your you know the second edition whatever <laughs> uh but i was looking at an interview that you did with the rpg codex and you were asked something about combat in Baldur's gate 2 i assume here Didn't okay really know, but you said the combat was spoken of favorably internally, but nobody outside a small handful of designers really liked the complexity of the A, D, and D rules. They were a pain, right? to be honest. It felt that a comparable combat experience could be crafted with a simpler system. So, you know, I guess uh, A, D, and D does kind of get a bad rep, you know, the tacos and, and all this stuff but i mean what was it in particular that just made this so cumbersome and, and what would you have wanted to change that's definitely tough um and i think every time i did help make a combat system that did change things um i think flavor was lost like i do think the overall complexity of the second edition rule system had like a, a magic flavor to it that um is hard to reproduce without making an equally complicated system um i think the thackle thing like that was a tough one like that like at the time it felt perfectly normal to me but uh, but when you explained it to other people who played anything it was like really like lower numbers better sometimes and not all the time and um right so that, that was a big one and then it was just so many exceptions throughout like like many of the spells right we had like half page long descriptions and you had to know all the little nuances um, but again, that was part of the fun. Uh, but in a video game, like you can't have like a 400 page manual. People aren't going to read it. Um, and then they're going to get confused. And what I noticed even with Baldur's Gate 2, um, even though I had spent a lot of work trying to make the spell battles more fun, when you brought like an artist on who had no D&D grounding at all, right? Oh, yeah. And you'd watch them play and it'd be like, it, it's confusion and chaos to the point of like, them giving up, right? And you never want people to give up on your games. Um, so we definitely saw that reflected a lot. We managed not to dilute it in Baldur's Gate 2, though, um, but it certainly influenced other games, that idea that um, just too many 
if you do this, then that happens. But if you also do that, then this other thing happens. And that's what you want, right? Because there was all the spell shields and the breaches. And, but, you know, that was fun for, for me as a designer and, mm-hmm. and to bring the other designers around. Like, can you beat this combat now? And it's like, oh, he beat it. Okay, I have to go and add another whatever layer of complexity to it. Um, uh, but, yeah, if I was to make a new combat system nowadays, I would probably look back at the second edition though and just see if I could really understand <laughs> what um you could strip out of it without losing it because it really felt like anything you took out of it it was um the entire thing fell apart mm-hmm. and it, you know you you just lost that 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 flavor to it everything else felt a little bit artificial um like the dragon age origins combat system i enjoyed but it's still i don't think it has that layer of feeling right that um the Baldur's gate games had um on the other hand a lot more people play it <laughs> the dragon age origin and the other Dragon Age games, so um, more people get to experience those games than um, watching people try to get through the Boulder's Gate mm. <laughs> to experience. So, um. yeah, I can. I mean, here's here's what here's my thinking on it, right? Is with the tabletop games, whether you're talking about second edition or whatever, you know, to me, to me, the idea is you have to keep the math at a level where people can basically do it in their heads, right? And if it's if it gets too complicated, then you're like, huh, you're spending all your time like fussing with the <laughs> the rule book, and you know. So there is that. Uh, but I remember when I talked to Johnny Wood, who was uh, working uh, <clears throat> for New World Computing, John Van Canningham, and he's t- he told me a little story about John Van Canningham one time, and uh, they were talking about the com the, the combat system in the uh, Might and Magic series, and JVC's position was it's 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 on a computer. Right. You know, we don't. We can make the math horribly complex to the point where nobody would ever be able. They'd never be able to make a tabletop version of this, right? And I just like something. I don't know how I feel about that. You know, <laughs> I mean, do you know what I'm saying? Like, what is the proper? Yeah, and I don't know if there is proper because they are two different types of games. Like, I know some games have to have complicated math. Like, I think the Diablo games use a very long formula for like regeneration of powers and stuff like that. I I did the homework once into looking at going, oh my gosh, you wouldn't do that on a tabletop. And yeah. even the Dragon Age Origin, um, we did play it as a tabletop game before the rule system was in line, um, and it took about ten times longer than a D and D combat, right? Because of the the math aspect. So I don't know if you should go into it designing a system going, I'm going to make hard math. Um, <laughs> uh, We're going to bring in a, all the statistical complexity we can muster on this. right? Yeah. I think if you need to use a complex math, right. To achieve whatever goal you're trying to aim for with balance and then sure, go ahead. Um, uh, again, if I was to make a combat system, I would try to make it pen and paper ish. Yeah. Even just from a prototyping point of view, um, the dragon age one was okay. You could, you could sit there and play with pen and paper, and uh, they did find balance issues with it prior to us implementing it, which was good. Um, usually the exploits, all right? We found a lot of exploits, like if we keep it this way, everybody's going to just run around with a dagger, and that would be the only weapon you need to use in the game. So, like, okay, we got to adjust some stuff. Um, so, yeah I, I, yeah, I don't know if you should just do math for math's sake. And I don't think you should do complexity for complexity's sake either, Um I think if you can make a system that could kind of grow naturally more complex over time, that's the ideal. Um, and I think that's what happened with second edition, right? It was kind of a system, and then they added something, and then they added something, and then they added something, right? And then you, it felt like a, a real thing, right? Because the world's complicated, right? Like, none of our existing systems in life are, like, well-designed. They're a very good point. <laughs> poorly designed, and then somebody designs a solution to the initial problem, and then another... I see the world as a lot of gameplay systems. Um, so when I'm looking at financial stuff or even social stuff, I'm like, yeah, that's a game system. And the designer is lazy who implemented it initially and should have done a better job. Uh, but obviously you can't do that in real life. But I think good game systems are like that too, in that they evolve this complexity level. That's hard to explain. And some games are just more fun for it. Yeah, you had mentioned Diablo and how you worked out on your own, I suppose, the sort of the math underlying that. I was thinking of Neverwinter Nights, one of the things I'd always do is turn on the option to show all the the formulas. Yes. I mean, how important do you think it is that they sort of make these formulas available to the player, or should it be hidden behind the scenes and just not to scare off the the artist? I'm not just kidding, but you know, to scare <laughs> off the people that... 
I don't know, it would be intimidated. I'm not, I don't, I'm not the, a math genius by any means. Right. You know, but I, I personally like to see that. I think for games that are, especially like the Baldur's Gate games, for what they were, they were trying to make a and d game, right? And I think it was important to show all the details for those games. Um, for a game that has no connection, right, to a, like a physical board game or, or a role-playing game, I don't know if it's as strong an argument. Um, I'd be curious to see more games do it and just see what the i mean for test even internally for testing stuff like this is super useful mm -hmm. right like um call of assurance is able to file a much more accurate bug if they're able to understand the inner workings of the system whether you always ship it or not i think that depends if it fits the flavor of the game um if i was to announce a you know try to make an old-fashioned rpg game i would probably have that information available because i would feel that's part of the the alert of that game but if i was making a you know, a more triple A um, simplified combat system game, I might not mm -hmm. include it because it's one, it might show how simple the system is and I want to hide that a bit. And, uh, you know, it might uh, not mean, mean as much, right, to players. I just, it always, now that I'm thinking about it, I wonder if there's something about feeling, a feeling of fairness. Mm. You know, when you can look and see, well, there's the formula. I see what yeah. happened there. I rolled a one or <laughs> rolled yeah. a two. No, I could understand that for sure. Yeah, because sometimes you think the AI is cheating on you or, or you know, um, like I don't like games that like... There's no way that rat rate. killed me. <laughs> right, like I don't like games that do pure auto scaling, for example, right? Like that does bug me. And uh, I think if, if the numbers are always... It's the goalposts. Yeah, because it's like really I'm like level 20 and the rat killed me because the rat's now level... 25 i don't so yeah um <laughs> the visibility shows you stuff like that yeah. um and obviously some game companies wouldn't want you to see it because then you're like what <laughs> um so yeah uh the right game makes sense for the right game um, i guess but, their argument might be well if we do this we'll make it easier to find an exploit maybe yeah no and and sometimes even um it can become a system in of itself i i do know even on the games i worked on right it'd be like we show a certain amount of information, but then we are asked to show more information. <laughs> and then right, we should be able to break the details down. And, and, right, and that's why you get all those options about how verbose you want your your combat log to be because... I just export right, to an like, Excel spreadsheet. <laughs> yeah, hook up a data source and <laughs> you have analytics off to the side. I, I don't, maybe somebody will make that game. I don't know. <laughs> right. Yeah, that sounds good. <laughs> That's one of the things I liked about the old SimCity game was all the charts and tables. Yes. And... I will just get a little bit more into Neverwinter Nights then. You know, I just did a review of that not too long ago on uh, playing the Enhanced Edition on Match. I really liked the game. You know, I can remember when it came out thinking a little bit, well, it's not Baldur's Gate. You know, there's definitely some differences there. But, you know, I, I think just it, you could take it, taken it by itself, it's still a really fun game. Now, you were telling the Codex, you know, you really kind of focused in on the engine, you know, the game mechanics. And you said, that's, you never, you said, you're certainly the most fun I've ever had. Right. In regards to the mechanics of building a game. But it took a very long time to be, to be usable. And so this is, I'm kind of curious about this because I know that's the game. One of the things I remember researching about and going through was just the, the editor and the number of people that just love this editor, and they tons and tons of... I think it might have been one of the first really user-generated content uh, extravaganzas or whatever. <laughs> it seemed like they are just mods out the... Right. Mods for days, or weeks, or years even. <laughs> and so what, what, what was it that... Yeah, what was it that made it so challenging, though? Yeah, well, it was an ecosystem... I think it was about the original campaign. Oh, uh, to build a... I'm trying to remember that quote in the context of it. But, um, yeah, so, I mean, a lot of focus at Bioware for Neverwinter Nights was about this tool set that people could use and making it usable. Um, when you have an internal tool, like the internal tools for the Baldur's Gate games, like, I don't know if there are screenshots of them out there in the universe or not, but they were very awkward to use, Um very much happy that I got them. Um, actually, uh, Mark Dara, um, who is still with um, Bioware, was uh, the lead programmer in Baldur's Gate 2, and he was really good about adding stuff to the tools and that, but they were very cumbersome and very um, 
like an average person couldn't come off the street and fire them up and know what to do. I barely knew what to do. I had to write notes to remember. Oh, if you geez. check that checkbox, don't check that other checkbox, and definitely User don't use that combo unfriendly. box if you check this other checkbox because everything will fail. Um, <clears throat> right. So trying to make tool. Yeah, and and so I mean, part of it was making a tool set that you know we could all use internally that was functional, and gave us all the power we needed, but that also at the same time somebody else who had no idea would be able to sit down and build something. So that that was a challenge. Um, but even at the technology level, then like when you have user created data, um, making sure it never crashes the engine, um, make sure it's robust, making sure it's flexible. How much flexibility do you want to give the end users? Right, like they're going to want everything. Um, so that's why we had to compromise. Um, I don't know how much you've dug into it, but there's like 2DA files, which are like text files that you could edit, right, to edit some of the, the, the more core game rules, right? So we made sure that was there for the more hardcore um, modders, right? They could go in and really start adjusting. Um, but then the, the visual tool set stuff, right, that was more for area creation, dialogue writing. Uh, the dialogue uh, conversation editor was a big thing. Um, Bioware's previous conversation editor on Baldur's Gate was not very good. Um, it was basically a database table, um, right? So you can easily see the connections between things. Um, so like that was a hugely beneficial tool to Bioware, the conversation editor. And it took a lot of work to get right because it had to make sense to the writers. It had to make sense to the designers who had to go in and script what the writers are doing. Um, and that's a tool that I suspect they still use some variant of it at Bioware um, to this day. And there's tons of tools. There's a faction system, right? The faction system, which would allow, like, you know, if I'm a friend of your friend who's my friend uh, and I see you pickpocketing wow. somebody, now your friend of your friend or your friend is now slightly angry at this other – like, it, like it's a very elaborate system. Um, uh, and we also made promises to the community throughout development. And then we had to fulfill those promises, right? So we had to be careful that um, – I mean, we weren't careful. Sometimes we made promises that we then had to go and follow through with, right? Like the faction system, I think, is one of those examples. Like we promised them like this universal faction system. We gave them a universal faction system, and it horribly broke the game for us as we were trying to develop content for it. Um, and so we'd often have to – like I think the faction system specifically, I had to go and put zeros in a whole bunch of columns because we were having weird situations where, like deer, were killing all the monsters in, in levels, and the deer were immortal. Um, so you come into an area doing testing and find everybody dead, like no challenge left for you. <laughs> Just these deer wiped everybody out because some weird thing happened in the faction system. So yeah, the it was faction. my first. <laughs> so the deer were considered part of the faction. Well, because they were probably a friend. Of some oh. other faction that these monsters upset <laughs> and enough that it passed the, the deer over a threshold oh, wow. hostility, and then they'd go on a murderous rampage um so th that was my first experience with real complicated systems and implications of right like you change one thing over here oh gosh you got <laughs> this big change um way over here um and i think i'd never internet all the areas ran at the same time so all the separate areas in the level would run. And so that had performance issues, that had AI issues moving between areas. So yeah, it's way more complicated than uh, I, I think people realize. And the scripting language, um, trying to have a C-style scripting language was awesome for designers, harder to explain to non-technical people, right? So there's challenges, but it's also awesome. We could write all the spells ourselves. On Baldur's Gate, that was all for programmers. Programmers had to do all the spells for, mm. for the designers. They'd give us a tool and some flags, but like Neverwinter Nights is like, I can write a fireball script today. Awesome. Um, so we had a lot of power at our disposal as well. And sometimes we used it poorly, um, and sometimes we used it well, and we had to develop best practices, and yeah, the design department of Bioware really um, matured mm -hmm. over Internet Nights, and then that engine technology was then used on a whole bunch of other games. I'm sort of playing with a thought here. I'm so, thinking about what you said with the Baldur's Gate engine that you had to work with being complicated and convoluted, and the Neverwinter Nights one being much smoother. Right. I mean, do you think it would be a valuable step for anybody creating a a role-playing game to think about this engine in terms of like, would somebody else be able to come in and make content for it? Would that somehow help them, even if they don't really intend to release it? Um, 
I, I again, I'm very biased, and I suspect you interview anybody from a different company, they would talk about their practices and procedures being the best or the ones that make the most sense for them. Mm-hmm. But I really feel the Neverwinter Nights engine is a good engine to take a look at and to try to build content for. I would encourage people to do it. It makes a lot of sense to me. <laughs> Um, um, and it was used a lot. It's still used, as far as I understand it. Um, educational institutes, um, I'd get contacted from people all over the place who had used it like as part of their um, research papers or teaching a, a class. Um, it was kind of Minecraft before Minecraft. I think Minecraft has really taken over that role where you know kids will play Minecraft in schools and that. But for a time, Neverwinter Nights was, was filling that role. Um, and that's how people were teaching kids how to make games, um, how to make, how teaching university students how to make games. The University of Alberta here in the city, they had a program that for a long time was using Neverwinter Nights as, as their teaching tool. Um, awesome. And I do feel with the right tutorials, it is easy enough to go ahead and try to build things. But now we have stuff like Unity and Unreal. Like anybody can download Unreal Engine and develop for it, yeah. Unity Engine. And that wasn't there at the time. Um, so I don't know if I would more advocate in favor of, of unity or something instead of neverwinter nights but um yeah a different universe nowadays i guess than back then yeah because that's what i told people in my book was if you want to if you're new to programming or new to coding or even if you're not you know you should take a look at the neverwinter nights okay engine or construction kit whatever it's I forget the name. <laughs> there's been a couple of different versions updates the, to it i suppose yeah i called it a tool set but the yeah, tool set there we go that's the word i'm looking for <laughs> look at that tool set because you know, I was kind of surprised that you had made uh, Dragon Age Origins in that. Right. So I don't know how many people know that, but I mean, this is definitely something to be taken seriously. Yeah, um, without it, I don't think we would have been confident enough in the writing on Dragon Age Origins because the technology, right, was being built for the the Dragon Age Origins engine. At the same time, for us to be able to play through, you know, Dragon Age in Neverwinter hugely valuable um but yeah i mean you could certainly use it as a prototyping tool if you are making a game a lot like neverwinter nights or Baldur's gate um it might still be a better tool than unity to get up and running as long as like it would only ever be a prototype right you wouldn't be able to release it but if you even wanted to prove out um, a couple conversation systems or something it might be the fastest mm-hmm. route to doing that um I guess I haven't really thought about if somebody wanted to release it commercially or something. I mean, would yeah, that, how would that, that's where would they, that even be? That's where they'd be legal or? <laughs> I don't think it'd be legal. I don't think there would be a framework um, for doing that. Um, I suspect Beamdog might be open to somebody doing like a full polished product, right, for them. I'm, I'm not entirely sure the state of affairs with that, but because um, uh, Neverwinter Nights did release premium modules, mm-hmm. right, at the at the time. Um, and that some of those were community built um, mo- modules, right? That um, fans had put together and and whatever. And I suspect, hopefully, they got some money out of it. I don't know how that all worked. Um, but yeah, you wouldn't be able to take Neverwinter Nights today and build your own game and, and sell it. Um, that would uh, not fly. <laughs> I'm sure there'd be some lawyers involved. Um, so prototyping only. Oh, well, you know, <laughs> lawyers just make everything more fun, don't they? Yeah, they definitely add a different layer. Now, there's a question related to this from Jonas Aguinaraz. Is, is, there, is there any news? I don't know if you know anything about this, but I'll go ahead and ask. Is there, is, do you have any news about the modules for Neverwinter Nights made by Beamdog? The modules? I'm not sure yeah, what any he means. News? I guess he's wondering if there are going to be some more or oh, what, whether what the they're status building is. Or, is okay. there anything you might know about it that's <laughs> not common knowledge? Yeah, no, I think I'm out of the loop enough um that i don't have a concrete answer i'm not aware of anything concrete being built so yeah i don't know if new content will be forthcoming or not um the the trouble with that is um there's not a lot of people who know how to build content for it right so i think that would be a challenge um uh, i think it's learnable for sure people could definitely learn how to go and build modules and that um and uh you need a decent testing department so one of the challenges also was Neverwinter Nights, right? It being fully multiplayer. Um, once you have a multiplayer game, you have to have a lot of quality assurance around mm-hmm. to test all the different permutations. Um, and that's harder for a smaller company like Beamdog to to start messing around with uh, multiplayer content. I think they'd have to uh, have to approach that very cautiously. Um, maybe they could do a single player experience, um, but I'm I don't know if if that's on their horizon or not. I think they're busy. I think they announced recently, Beamdog, right? They're doing 
uh, console ports of some of the some of the games. So I think that's their focus right now, and the access and allies online. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the multiplayer was even giving you guys a lot of trouble, right? From, yes, from coming from Baldur's Gate to Neverwinter Nights. Yeah, that's a just talk about a layer of complexity. Yeah, it's really hard to craft that great story experience, but then also allow for, you know, Bob might come running through the scene ch- being chased by 10 monsters, or somebody drops a fireball on you, or all these other things. And I think we maybe simplified the main campaign a bit too much to because we were so worried about all these horrible events that could happen. Um, that yeah that we kind of steered on the level of caution but we saw a lot of bad things happen internally i know i certainly i was playing um so ray and greg right were the owners of bio or the founders i remember once playing uh, a neverwinter nights module testing with ray and we were all level two or something um but ray didn't get the memo and he was like <laughs> i don't know level 16 or something oh, and he wow. was not communicating with us and he was running through and opening doors and i think all the monsters are spawning at like a higher level or something the encounters were and uh and really yeah, so like, way. like so you had to test. Like, what do you te- What if you have low level players as a high level player, right? Like, there's just so many combinations. What if you have a party of all mages? Everybody decided to be a mage, and they're running through the campaign. And is it playable? Can you finish it? Um, so yeah, uh, lots of bodies needed to to test all these things, mm-hmm. and not the most fun job. You're a wizard going to play this one map over and over and over and over and over today. Awesome. Yeah. I don't think people really appreciate the. I mean, that's that really is the work. Yes. You know, that goes yeah. into it. The, the job Pass part. The reason that you get the paycheck, right? The, yeah. <laughs> and what was it behind the scenes of you know around these issues of you want to have a option to create a whole party? Are you creating characters? You know, how do you feel about the the henchman system? Um, for Neverwinter Nights specifically, yeah. yeah, I definitely think that was something that came out weak with the initial campaign, um, and it was kind of an afterthought, um, right? There was a feeling that people would just play with their friends, right? You don't need henchmen. Of course, that assumes it's, you have friends. <laughs> well, you have friends, are friends able to play, um, right? And that's the discrepancy between what you think you're building and what you actually build, um, right? Like, I was a big Dungeons & Dragons person, and I assumed I'd play Neverwinter Nights all the time with my friends, mm-hmm. But it's really hard as adults to get everybody's schedule synchronized, right? Um, so a lot of people wanted a single-player experience still. And when you play a single-player experience, you do expect henchmen having some control over your party, those kinds of things. Um, and so I think that was underserved. And I think it was served better in the, um, the expansion packs for Neverwinter Nights. Um, and then, yeah, the step further, like, should you have been allowed to roll your own and and, right, like, recruit your own like Icewind, more Icewind Dale style, and those discussions certainly happened, and we compromise, and you oh, know what's we going pick, on at the lunch table with it. <laughs> we, yeah, we pick the you know the best approach we can. Um, like I believe the original Baldur's Gate games, right? You could kind of fake an Icewind Dale style, fully custom party, right, by playing multiplayer with yourself, right? So there was a workaround um, for that, if m- my memory serves me correctly, because I remember having that discussion as well. Um, I believe there is a way to, to do that. I could be wrong. Um, our, our technology has changed. The enhanced editions maybe don't allow it. Um, I, I don't know for sure. Um, but yeah, no, we definitely talked. Every, like we played everybody else's games, right? We always like, hey, they did this really cool thing, and can we do that? Uh, not without delaying the game, right? Or um, I'd often be mean, and I would uh, somebody would come up with a cool feature. I'd be like, well, then you pick your other cool feature you want it, and we're going to remove that. Oh. You have to- your two favorite no oh! <laughs> so yeah you, a lot it, of hearts crushing dreams Brent. yeah there is a little bit of dream crushing happening well we gotta t- i think we have to talk a little bit about hordes of the underdark okay you know so <laughs> you know people say i don't really see what all the criticism is to be honest about the original campaign okay you know to me it was fine i don't have any problems with it but you know i do see a lot more praise for that uh, the expansion. So, just wondering, what did you know then that you didn't know back in the, or what was different, I guess, or what 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 explains the quality difference? Um, well, I think with Neverwinter Nights, we knew the story would be different, the original campaign, than the Baldur's Gate games. We knew it would be a lighter story. Um, we felt the other aspects would still make it better, right? The uh, playing with your friends, um, all that kind of stuff. Um, 
and we had a lot of schedule disruptions. So um, I think like plan A had to be thrown away, plan B had to be thrown away, plan C, once you're down to plan C, you only have a few months left, right? That also limits what you can accomplish. Um, trying to write for multiplayer was hard. And again, like I said, we over maybe oversimplified things or were too cautious um, to try to make everything work. Like, what if the guy with the plot item quits? Or right? like, how do you handle those kinds of things? Um, and it was new, right? So as much as I like the Neverwinter Nights engine, it was a new engine. And whenever you have a new engine, your story and other content can't be as um, uh, rich and deep, right? Like, so Neverwinter Nights one could not compare favorably to Baldur's Gate two. Because Baldur's Gate 2 was a mature engine. Uh, Never learned tonight, so it's building everything as it went. Um, so we kind of had an inkling, right, that the story wouldn't resonate as much as as the past story. But we thought all the other bells and whistles would more than make up for it. Um, and, yeah, they got a lot of negative feedback on that. The game did well. And it was um, really praised for what it did good. Um, but, you know, it hurt all of our feelings, certainly, mm. to, you know, like, oh, the characters aren't as interesting, or the story's not as interesting, right? So that kind of creates, like, an inner... It's so subjective, though, you know? And it is very subjective. Like, like I certainly enjoyed lots of Neverwinter Nights. I do think there's a lot of uh, monotony that I would have rather remove, and that was maybe more of my focus on Hordes, is I don't like monotonous gameplay, um, where you have to open every container and, and, and chest and get one gold piece here, one gold piece here. And, you know, yeah. there were mistakes that we certainly made. Um, on that core design, right, in the original that I wanted to address. Um, and as well, we had writers, though, like, and I mean, if your job is a writer and people are not happy with your writing, right, you want that chance to do better. And so I think Hordes was us giving them that chance to, well, show them what you can really do, right? Like, you know, the technical limitations kind of limit what you were able to do the first time around. I'm going to remove them. Uh, Hordes isn't multiplayer, Right, and that caused. I got a few emails about that from people. Um, right, so a multiplayer game engine, but the second expansion pack was single player only. It made them so, upset, I suppose. It made some people upset. A lot fewer though than hmm. right people were worried about. Right, which really did signal that a lot of people play these games single player. Um, yeah, I mean, and I did. I've only recently started to play any of them on multiplayer. Yeah, so we definitely, um, you know, went went in hordes wanting a, a stronger story wanting to have a couple plot twists wanting to even do more at the technical level all right so there's some really cool stuff that does happen in there that the programmers didn't think was possible um, and that was purely because we had time to play around with what do you mean you can actually spawn in another tile set on top of an existing tile set by using the visual effects system right and that was us just hacking to be honest like and it worked, right? So I, I know the last chapter of the game does a lot of neat um, where tiles are swapping in and out, but it's that's actually done at the scripting level, not at the programming level. Um, I think there are some programming hooks to support it, if I remember correctly, but that was that was fun. That was kind of a lot like Baldur's Gate 2, right? Where I had a mature tool set, had a whole bunch of really talented designers, and they got to inject their fun into it um, as well. Each chapter was written and created by their own team. So my job as lead was just to make sure that they weren't totally out of sync with each other, but they do have a, di a different play style each chapter. You know, people are picking up on this common theme in this <laughs> interview. The smaller teams are better. <laughs> better for a certain type of game, yes. Yeah. yeah, like that, you know, the smaller team is not going to make that 10 million unit selling game, but that's probably okay, right? You just have to make a, a game that's profitable enough that you can make the next game. All right, I, do, I did have a... Quick question about KOTOR, Knights of the Old Republic. So you didn't work on that game, correct? Or why didn't you choose to work on it? Or did it was it not? I don't remember if I had a choice on that one. Um, I, I no, I I really was. Um, I think they needed a lead designer on the expansion packs for Neverwinter Nights, mm -hmm. and if my timeline is correct, um, they were happening at the same time because I know we were trading designers between the two teams. You can have my writer for a while, but then I get your writer later. Um, so, yeah, they were kind of going in tandem. Um, I did a lot of playtesting um, for KOTOR and uh, did contribute some story ideas. Um, and, yeah, I would have liked to work on it. Like, yeah, Star Wars was definitely a big, big thing for me, but it was also yeah. super cool to kind of um, – the nice thing with everybody being focused on Knights of the Old Republic – is nobody was paying attention to us on Hordes of the Underdark. There's that theme so, again. <laughs> so we were kind of, you know, allowed to do our own thing, right? I, we weren't the important 
child. <laughs> we were. It sounds exactly like Tim K <laughs> talking about Fallout, and everybody was too obsessed uh, with the Sent to Under Mountain. Mm, okay, yeah, they didn't yeah. Pay attention to Fallout. And... <laughs> of course, Nice of the Republic worked out a little better than that game, but <laughs> still yeah, same principle, right? For sure. Would you rather have worked on Knights of the Old Republic? Or... No, I no, I think I, I was really happy getting um, to kind of have a, a project that was, you know, mostly on my own. Like Trent, Trent was still involved because so Trent Oster was um, the the producer, right, um, or project director on the Neverwinter Nights franchise. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, but we had a small team, and I I I was missing that at that point from Baldur's Gate too, and um, I would have liked to have done a, maybe a bit more with Star Wars. Um, but yeah, you know, I got to play it, right? So I kind of had the best of both wor- worlds. I could send email to people saying, "Hey, I hate this. Could you guys change it?" And they would change it. So, um, yeah. So I guess I still got to have some indirect involvement mm-hmm. on Star Wars. Um, I am jealous that I never got to go on any of the trips. I, I do know some of the oh, team got to sense. to see like the Skywalk Skywalker, Skywalker Ranch. Yeah, and they would come back and tell us about all the cool props they got to see and. Oh. We were, we were, there was some jealousy there for sure. <laughs> Absolutely. It's terrible. Um, and some of the people that they got to meet and everything. <laughs> yeah. I see you got the poster back there for it. Though. Yeah. Yeah. I was trying to, I'm, I'm in my basement. I tried to decorate it a little bit. So I, I got some of my props <laughs> out here. But yeah, I have posters for several of the old games. They're not all framed, though. Some of them are just so rolled in, in storage. So that was something they'd give out to all of us when um we were done games and that like there was always posters floating around so got lots of that here and there and uh um i think i wrote a neverwinter nights poster over there (laughs) i do have one i was like oh can i get it set up in time nope no i don't have a frame for it so (laughs) it's it's sitting up in my hallway (laughs) so um yeah It, it that was another fun thing at bioware and i think all game companies are like this right you get a lot of branded stuff right and you kind of you know, I can look around my desk, look at things. I got coffee cups. I've got sweaters. I've got yeah, just little things to remind you, right, of the that product you delivered. Mm-hmm. You ever get any swords or axes or weaponry or anything like that for? Yeah, I do have a sword. I don't know if I can without knocking my uh, <laughs> destroy set, the base. Apart, but yeah, I think lots of people have seen these. These were the Baldur's Gate two swords. Oh, so they wow, were just that's like, a collectible. Yeah, so we all God, got what one do of these. I have to do to get one of those. You might be able to do I, eBay. Do I have it to kill you to get it? <laughs> you, but I might have. Can one I loot that from your body? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, one of the few that are still attached. So, oh, that is I so think cool. One, several of my coworkers went into the hallway with each other and started sword fighting. Ah, oh. and so some of these fell apart <laughs> rather rather quickly. Um, and I think Trent might still have his. I thought I saw it in the office. Um, so we're talking uh, maybe one or two in existence at this point. Oh, I, I would assume there. I don't know. Actually, let's just say there's maybe ten. If there's sure. ten swords left. I don't that know. Is... Uh, I'm sure a few other people took care of theirs too. So. <laughs> oh, it just pains. It just pains me to think because <laughs> so they're just out there banging them together, right? And... Uh, yeah, right outside my office. I remember. Yeah, one of them breaking their sword. <laughs> so yeah. Oh. Well, I'm glad you still have yours. That's cool. Does that have a? It's not edged, is it? Is it? Oh, no, no. There, there's no like blade to the blade. It's perfectly safe. It's heavy. It's a little heavy, actually. But yeah. Who made those? Is it? Oh, I'd have to. I don't know if anybody would even remember. Um, uh, Ray and Greg were really good though about trying to find cool stuff like that. So I think they probably went and found somebody somewhere who was making swords and and got them for us. Um, right, so they were really good about giving back to the team. Um, I know who could make them nowadays, though. I don't. Uh, so Trent at Beamdog, he uh, he is a blacksmith now as well. I don't know if that gets posted publicly very often, but um, I see that on my Facebook feed from him. So often. he's selling he built, swords now. He doesn't sell. He just builds. He just builds. So um, yeah, he's got swords and axes and all kinds of things. So um, hmm. yeah, yeah. He's <laughs> who knows? Maybe one day he'll start selling. That might be a uh, quite a, uh, maybe sorry. the next big collector's edition, you know, the ultimate. <laughs> you should write into Beamdog and, and ask them. That the next collector edition should include a dagger made by yeah. Trent. I know. Keep busy. The words <laughs> tell they gave me a, one of the reliquaries for that. And okay. It's pretty cool, but, you know, it's, I think, a dagger. <laughs> Everybody can use a dagger. For yeah, sure. it's a very useful. 
<laughs> sure. <laughs> well, let's talk a little bit about Jade Empire then. You know, this was an Xbox exclusive game. And I was looking at it on a Wikipedia. I did, reviewed it a long time ago, but uh, you know, just kind of prep for this. I was looking at the Wikipedia page for it. And there was a comment there I thought was interesting. I, I wasn't aware of this, but apparently this was a, quote, dream project uh, for Ray and, and Greg. You know, what was it like uh, behind the scenes on Jade Empire? Was there any controversy about the console? And... Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I'm trying to remember, like, what do I remember? And then what well, can I say? It was 2005. I mean, it wasn't exactly <laughs> yesterday. But. Um, so something that I suspect happens at most game companies is when there are multiple projects, you really focus on your own project. Mm -hmm. um, right? And I had been heavily focused on the Neverwinter games and then on um, Dragon Age, the initial planning of Dragon Age. So Jade Empire for a lot long time was just that other game being made over there oh, uh, ouch. <laughs> right and i'd be consulted sometimes um i definitely hired like interviewed and hired people to help them on their team but wasn't directly involved um it wasn't appealing to me like to be honest like yeah it was definitely a dream project of other people um but i had no um experience in that kind of literature domain or anything like that, right? Mm -hmm. Like it was way outside my ballpark of experience. Um, but I was interested in it. Like, you know, I had worked with many of the people who were working on it and I was really curious about how it would turn out. Um, but I, I definitely, I'm sure I probably had a few lunch meetings going, you know, we make RPGs, not action games. You know, we <laughs> don't have any console <laughs> experience. So I'm sure I annoyed people um, mm -hmm. with that. Um, but, um, yeah, it was a different energy. Um, it was kind of a new team, though, finding their way. Um, and uh, and it was fun, even in the early days, like when I did try it out. Um, but it didn't feel like anything Bioware had done previously, right? So some of us, even then I was starting to become an old-timer, were maybe concerned about mm -hmm. it being so different and outside our um, experience. Was there ever any, any talk about a sequel to it or is that... Um, I, I don't think it did that poorly, did it? I, seemed to, I don't think it did poorly. It and pretty well. And to be honest, so I eventually moved on to the project, right? And um, I really enjoyed it. Um, I was frustrated that I was taken away from the project I had been working on, but it was a great experience for me. I got to learn how to develop for a console, learn how to develop an action-based combat system. Um, sadly, I had to cut a whole bunch of stuff, which was often my role at Bioware was... Okay. Writing a document explaining why things had to be cut, right, to get done in time. For technical reasons or oh, for time? Well, for time, for timeline, right? Um, they were a very ambitious team. Like, they were really eager. Um, and they had built a lot more art than they were ever going to get into the game at one time. Um, so, yeah, I actually ended up really enjoying my experience on it. Um, I think I write one of my blog posts, um, you know, like, I actually even did cutscenes. I think that's the only time in any Bioware game where... There are a few cutscenes that I actually script it myself, which is not my experience level. Like I, I have no cinematic experience at all. At all. Um, but yeah, so it ended up being fun, um, and there was definitely talk uh, of sequels. And I'm, I, 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 like work was certainly put towards you know trying to develop the concept out further, um, and some of the stuff what I saw was really cool. Like there was certainly prototype work in directions that. Um, you know, it would have been a game I would have played because I had gotten hooked on Jade. And Jade did well. I don't think it did, like, super well. Um, but I think it was profitable. Mm -hmm. You'd have to talk to somebody more at the financial level. Um, and uh, I think it was an important game for Bioware to make, even internally, just to at least understand what developing for a console would be like. You know, what does an action be system? Um, some of those lessons, I think, influence Mass Effect. Yeah, I definitely see some, you know, just as a story and plan, I, I definitely see a lot of the influence of that game. Or maybe it's a lot of the stuff that was learned, I guess, making that game yeah. find its way it, into some of the... Yeah, no, for sure. I, even I not, think... not even Bioware stuff, but just a lot of other games. Okay, yeah. Was there talk at Bioware about, you know, around the console market, any sense of like, well, it needs to be dumbed down for this audience or simplified or anything like that? Or was or was the assumption that these folks are pretty much the same as the PC gamers? Or <laughs> um, I don't know if anybody would ever use that kind of language. Oh, um, sure. I think certainly there's a push to um, make the games playable and maybe remove some of the more obscure 
elements, those discussions would be handled differently by different groups, <laughs> right? Uh, no, yeah. nobody like would ever uh, mandate making right? them more accessible. Or <laughs> yeah, and and but it's hard to to know what that means, right? Like you can make a very complicated and convoluted console game, um, and um, I think it was more of a challenge of some of these games play quite differently. Can they even play well on a console? Can we even you know make a party based RPG? on the console, what kind of choices are you going to have to have to make? What kind of sacrifices? Like you're not going to have as full control, right? So it was like, how do we still allow as much control as possible? Because that was really important um, while still making it a console experience. Um, so it was, a, it was just a huge learning opportunity. Um, and I think sometimes things were simplified more than they needed to be. Other things remain more complicated than they needed to be. Nobody's perfect at this. But at, at no point did anybody ever go through and start like, you have to cut 25% of your design document out because it's too complicated. Or they'd go through UI and go, too complicated. Like nothing like that ever happened. But we all tried to learn like how we, how we could keep an experience as close to what we were all enjoying playing on the PC, but put it on the console. That seemed like the way it should be. You know, really, I, I sometimes talk to people and I feel like they have a sense of make just nothing, you know, making the console version is just about compromise. Right. You know, whereas yeah. it seems like it's really just a different. It's a different problem to solve. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we maybe solved it poor, like not as well as we could have because we lacked the experience, right, in the console domain. Um, but, you know, we learned it over time. Um, even on Dragon Age Origins, um, this isn't the version that ended up shipping. But we did start playing around with the console version relatively early in the pipeline. Um, so some of us just got into an office together and got um, a, con a controller working on the Windows version just to get a feel for. But we had we had designed the PC version first, right? So we were like, how do we make the controller work with the PC interface? Okay, so what changes would have to be made to the interface without compromising, right? So we had a lot of that discussion early, trying to get hands on, so you're not um, living in that theoretical land of, well. You just have to simplify everything because it's like, oh, no, actually, you know what? We can keep our menus pretty close if we do this, right? So, yeah, hands-on, playing around with it. Yeah, that's good. I see a lot of criticism of games where they do the console version first, and then right. you sort of have the opposite problem. Of, you know, the thing is obviously oriented around a gamepad. Yeah. It's not you're... working very well. with. The... Yeah. But UI design is very challenging, right? Like the whole user experience. Um, I bet you there are some really smart people out there who can make a very cool RPG with a very cool console control scheme that still feels very natural on PC. I'm not that person probably, but I'm sure there's somebody out there who maybe they've done it already um, or, or could do it. I mean, I'm a, you're talking to a sort of diehard PC gamer here. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you know mouse but, and keyboard, thank you. But, well, this might horrify you for a while on Dragon Age Origins because I so enjoyed the controller version that we had prototyped. I kept on playing it for a long time. It was um, <laughs> it, it was less strenuous on my arms. I could just sit there with the, the gamepad in my hand and, and still navigate everything really well. So I think I played it long after we decided um, that we were going to mothball that for a while and not worry about it. I kept on like plugging my controller in and and, and, and playing, so... <laughs> Yeah. No, nothing wrong. I can certainly see that. <laughs> see that. And a lot of it's just what you're used to, right? Yes. Well, we kind of already jumped jumped into Dragon Age Origins, and you know, this game was this was a game that was a long time in development. I think uh, RPG Codex says it was six years in development. I don't know. <laughs> you can confirm that. It's probably around that for sure. Yeah. No, uh, but obviously a lot of changes between that game and Neverwinter Nights. And, like you know, I, I told you earlier, I was kind of surprised to hear that you had prototyped a lot of it with the Neverwinter Nights right. engine. But I'm just kind of wondering, what do you see as like the biggest, most significant changes, and how, the, how did that impact what you were doing? The the difference between Dragon Age and Neverwinter Nights. Right. Um, yeah. Okay. Have to put my memory hat on. Uh, a huge, like a large, large focus on story for Dragon Age Origins, like much larger than. <clears throat> was there on Neverwinter Nights. Um, uh, a lot of plots got um, written and rewritten and rewritten. Um, so, and the, uh, the world building, right? So we didn't have to do that with Neverwinter Nights, right? We're Dungeons and Dragons right. world. 
um, a lot of effort was spent, spent on the world building and, you know, running it through different groups to kind of get a feel for what it could be like. The world changed. It used to be a little bit more magical. It kind of got a little less magical. Um, I think uh, the uh, Game of Thrones novels had an influence on Dragon Age development at a point, right, from a world building point of view. Um, from a gameplay system point of view, even if we had wanted to, we knew we wouldn't be able to reinvent second edition Dungeons and Dragons, right? Because that had been a real system that had evolved over very many years. But we wanted a system that felt like it, mm-hmm. tasted like it. Um, so, yeah, it was a lot of like from the ground up building that we had never had to do before. So in many ways, those are like the larger challenges. Um, the technical challenges are consistent across projects. Yeah, we need a, you know, we need a graphic renderer. We need a, we need a tool set. We need this. We need that. I don't think we changed a lot in that area. It was more of building something from scratch, um, and then a world that made sense, story that made sense in that world. Um, <clears throat> you know, we definitely fought for party control. Right, mm-hmm. felt. Um, we had a pillars document i'm trying to remember what the actual pillars were but certainly party control um for me was always important um i i felt that was the flavor from the older games and and why i initially had some issues with jade empire as well because i felt like i have to control six people if i don't control six people it's not a bio or game um so i I can't remember. We compromised down to four, I think, right? For Dragon Age Origins, I don't remember what the actual number was. But <clears throat> um, but yeah, you had to have party control. You had to have direct control over your party members, right? So, you know, um, we, we definitely wanted that that in place. Um, I think um, uh, one of the designers, there's a, um, a party control system. He crafted to automate some of the party control, right? So those are kind of some of the changes we were doing. Um, but yeah having your party members more involved actually was also a change. So I think Dragon Age, the the party members are, are quite involved in a lot of the conversations and the and the plot. Um, I think everybody remembers Boulder, the Boulder's Gate games a little bit differently um, in that, especially the first one, there was very little involvement, right? The second one, there was more involvement. But Dragon Age actually had a lot of party member interaction because I remember, oh, we need this guy here for this plot. Oh, okay, all right. So, and that comp Complicates your design, right? If you know Alistair needs to be present, right? How you have to design the game around him being necessary, right, to the to the plot. Mm. Um, so yeah, it was actually quite a complicated um, story and plot experience to put together. Yeah, one of the things related to this note. Uh, this is a comment. I'm trying to remember where this came. Oh, this is also from the Codex interview. Uh, you talked kind of comparing Dragon Age Origins with Baldur's Gate. Uh, two, you were saying, well, because that game content did not have to be <coughs> locked down too early for the voiceover and cinematics, you had more development time. But with AAA titles, and I assume Dragon Age, it becomes harder to tweak the content in the later stages of uh, development. Right. I mean, that sounds like exactly what was going on there. Yeah, no, f- for sure. And that's why prototyping in Neverwinter Nights was important. Right, so we could at least do a baseline. Okay, Dragon Age doesn't suck, right? Like the <laughs> the story overall makes <laughs> makes sense, yeah. and and the characters are okay. Um, but yeah, and that was something that concerned me going forward in the future too. Is like these things are all like the NPCs are being voiced, all fully voiced, and so everything has to be perfect. And how do you know that two years before you put the content no, in the game engine? There's um, no way you can, right? Right, and then so other AAA games get away with it because they don't have the level of writing that a Bioware game does, right? Like if you only have a few thousand words to record, that's that's nothing. If you have five hundred thousand words to record, and that's like dozens and dozens of actors who all have different schedules, and you have to change a sentence, um, so that was definitely. And I didn't have to deal with that complexity directly, which I'm grateful for, but. Um, I mean, the team grew and grew and grew, and there was all the support staff, right, just to make sure that, you know, everything that's written is getting voiced and translated. And, um, yeah, so it felt like, yeah, some binders are going to be put on us in the future. Um, Dragon Age Origins did not have player voice, thankfully. That made things a bit easier. <laughs> yeah. Right, but there was a huge internal push to do so, right, to to definitely have the, the main character voiced. Oh, there was a push to do that. Oh yeah, I had a few meetings where I had to 
really explain the cost of what that would be, especially late in development, um, right? Because it wasn't maybe initially planned to do it, right? But uh, the longer a game goes in development, the more people want to add into it and the more the game industry changes, right? So if Dragon yeah, Age took five years, years or whatever, long enough. Was there a console right? generation in between there? I don't... I, I think there probably was, right? Like So like the game you think you're making year one, by the time you're actually at year three or four, a bunch of things have changed. Those changes do get incorporated. Like you do, you do um, pivot a bit, right? Um, so like Dragon Age did redo the art a few times, right? So things take a long a time to get times. done. Art <laughs> needs redo to change. the art a few times. That sounds right? like a lot, <laughs> like a pretty um, substantial. Uh, well, no, it, it, yeah, it's a it's a huge cost, right? Um, so yeah, I guess that definitely limited. Like Baldur's Gate two at the last moment, if I need to change a line of dialogue, I could just change a line of dialogue right um there was no impact dragon age yeah you had to lock down earlier and um working on their current titles and that like it, it must be so hard for them to uh yeah. to to get them ship ready and and to at least to be able to play and prototype and make it fun that's a good thing i think for people to hear and, and think about and especially people that are fans of indie rpgs is you know when they start demanding like voiceovers for everybody yeah. Like, do you really know what you're asking for? If you ask for voiceover for everything, you're going to get 50% less choice <laughs> in your game. Um, <laughs> like, it's just the inevitable, right? Unless you um, auto-generate gener- your voice or something. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I mean, like the old synthesizer voice. Yeah. yeah that's probably not the best. Uh, if you made a science fiction-themed game, you could maybe get away with it. But Everybody would be a Stephen Hawking. Yes. Like... <sighs> There is a quick question from Bob Erd again. And says, since you're a lead designer on Dragon Age Origins, is there any chance of a Dragon Age Origins inspired title from Beamdog? One with multiple origin points would be amazing. That was one of the best features ever. Yeah, you know, I do have to say that was one of the things that really impressed me about the game too. Because <clears throat> I'd originally played it with, a, I think, a wizard character. Not really okay. even knowing about the multiple origin points. Oh, uh, okay. For the, my video, I played a different, I think, an elf. I don't remember the class but anyway i was like wow this is like a totally different you know experience this is yes. a lot you know this is a big a lot bigger of a change than you get most right games i mean yeah so i don't know about the beam dog thing i guess you can talk about yeah. that but i just kind of like to hear your thoughts on this whole multiple origin points thing too yeah yeah i don't yeah i don't think the beam dog thing would um ever be a possibility but who knows maybe in 10 years they'll do an enhanced edition for Dragon Age. I have no idea. <clears throat> but I really like the multiple origins. Um, and I, I I, wish that had persisted somehow. Because um, even though it feels like a big change um, from a practical development cost way, it wasn't like as crazy as it seems. Um, because the rest of the game didn't reflect it in every piece of content, right? Mm-hmm. But because you had such a different beginning, it was like a lens yeah. that you saw the rest of the game through, even if the writers and designers didn't write content for it, you still perceive the rest of the game differently. Um, and I, yeah, so I thought it was a, re- a relatively low cost way of, of adding this cool choice and super replayable, right? Like you don't have to play each of them all the way to the end, but like, yeah. l- like you get try them all out and you get a few extra hours of gameplay. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, a lot of games, you would, like for me, I want to wait a few years to play it again because you feel yeah. like it'd be too repetitive. But I mean, with this, you pick a different character. And it's a yeah. totally different story, and um, it's kind of cool seeing the different hooks that every um, group got to get recruited, right? Like the, the different way they all got recruited and, and that. So yeah, I had a lot of fun playing through all the different um, um, beginnings and I mean, obviously, there are a few that didn't make the cut, right? So there are a few that I've played that nobody else oh, wow. has outside of the the development team. So and some of them, cut. Were, some of them are very good, right? Like uh, they just, you know, budget, and you have to make choices. So they 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 didn't get to see the light of day. Um, but yeah, um, I think there's uh, a game system other games could certainly um, steal. And um, if I was making an indie game, certainly would would look at borrowing that concept again in the future. Um, I don't know if it had as much love internally as it did for some external players, because yeah, I don't think it was really really discussed after afterwards. Yeah, I could see it as one of those things that might not be you know the value might not be apparent initially, 
yeah. it's more like one of those things. It's more about the replay, replaying it two or three years later that it really strikes you. Like, this was a great feature. Yeah. Might yeah. not no, sell it, copies initially, but... <laughs> And it really helped to viewers. build the world too, right? Yeah. Like, like it was, yeah, no, no, I, I, I definitely, I haven't played it in a long time, but, um, the, the multiple beginnings makes me more inclined to try it out than other things. All right. So I, I had quite a few comments along these lines about Dragon Age Origins. And I noticed it seems like, uh, I don't know how I feel about this to be honest, but I'm kind of curious what your take is, but they, they claim it was, uh, Bioware's last true, CRPG, <laughs> whatever that means. And, you know, I, I do think, you know, just as a player, we've talked about this a couple of times, that, you know, there are obviously AAA role-playing games coming out. Uh, but just to me, they don't really feel like anything comparable to Baldur's Gate or even right. Neverwinter Nights or Dragon Age Origins. So, you know, I just wonder, like, what is it? Why is it that we just can't seem to scratch that itch? Is it just nostalgia you know what is it that's not coming through or are we just getting old <laughs> um, what's going I, on i think some of it is old and nostalgia um i uh i think that's only a small part of it but i know for myself if somebody is to throw a massive two-hour role-playing game at me i might not even try it out right because it's like ah, I, I i got stuff to do um <clears throat> excuse me so um so part of it definitely being nostalgia, part of it being Bioware was lucky to have a whole bunch of different types of talent at one time. Um, so I think kind of blessed to have some really good writers, really good artists, really good um, technical people who are maybe in line, even if they didn't totally agree to the vision of something like that, like um, they worked well together and things were balanced. So much like the gameplay systems being balanced, I think there was balance to the different groups. Um, and, uh, I think that balance differential has, uh, I don't think other studios have necessarily had, that, had it, right. You can look at certain other game studios in the space and, okay, these guys are way more gameplay, right? So they've, um, they've got a lot more gameplay, but the story is not really where it needs to be. Um, uh, I've seen, uh, some studios just replace story with lots of writing and not interesting writing. Right, like the characters aren't interesting. Yes. Um, there's a lot of text. We've but, seen a few games is, like that. Yeah. Isn't worth <laughs> reading, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I think when Bioware, um, like for those types of games, like just everybody was kind of balanced. There's like the right amount of writing. And, you know, some people still complain there's too much writing, but there's the right amount of combat. Some people still complain there's too much combat. Um, but overall, it, the, the 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 different parts were more equally um, weighed. Um, and when you have that, right. Like it goes back to that. I think you have a little bit of exploration. You have a little bit of combat. You have a little bit of storytelling. Um, and that's part of that formula. Um, and I also feel that party, the party is a big deal. Um, and I think it's under undervalued. The, the idea of having at least two or three sidekicks running around with you, able to kind of interject or banter or comment on things at, at certain moments, and then having a variety of those. So you can play one run through with, you know, henchmen A, B, and C. Next one is A, D, and G. Um, and you have this different personal story, um, right, that you're able to tell, right? Because, oh, that time, you know, whatever, Minsk or whoever, he said this crazy thing. And I was like, what? I never had him at that moment. I had somebody else and something different happened. Um, so again, they allow for these different stories to unfold. And I think the more personal those stories are to you, the more you maybe hold on to them. And I don't see a lot of other companies doing that, but some do. And admittedly, I, I think the age part creeps in because I, I fire them up. And I'm like, I'm not even going to give this game a chance, really, because I don't have the time. right? So I can't say, in all fairness, whether they met the mark or not, because I didn't give them the chance that I would have 15 years ago when I didn't have so many responsibilities. Um, so, yeah, I think it could be done. But I think um, I was very fortunate to work at Bioware kind of in that period of time where we were all on the the same page, even when we weren't totally on the same page. But we were close enough to the same page um, that we all listened to each other and tried to balance what everybody was trying to accomplish. Yeah, I completely agree about the, the party control. I'm just thinking a lot of the games, uh, a lot of Bioware's games that will allow that. I almost get sort of, uh, you know, obsessive about trying to spend equal time. <laughs> <laughs> with each, okay with each you know 
party member option just to, you know, I don't want to just feel like I, well, I haven't uh, played with this character for a while. Right. You know, it's kind of a way to keep it fresh, but, you know, yeah. just, you know at the same time, it does kind of feel like that group of friends and like you have yes. relations, you have bonds to these characters. Oh yeah, for sure. And I mean, um, players definitely have attachments right to the characters there's lots of fan fiction written and and other things but for those of us who don't go that far we still walk away from that game with that that feeling that we just hung around with some some really cool people and did some really cool things together with them all right so this is a comment that a couple of people brought my attention to from your wikipedia page Brent, you know, okay. I don't know if you know you have a <laughs> Wikipedia page. <laughs> I do. I haven't checked it recently. Hopefully there's nothing controversial there. But... Well, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> uh, this is the comment. I'll just read it to you. Uh, so they said, I think this is from an interview. I'm not sure where they got the, the, uh, the quote from. But anyway, they got you saying, uh, as a designer, uh, you feel that party control and tactical combat should be huge factors in a role-playing game. I don't think that's controversial. At least not to me. Right. Uh, but here's the the rub. Dragon Age 2's departure from that is what made you realize that you would not be satisfied with what that game would be. Mm, okay, yes. So I don't know what the context of that was, or if that's something you would agree with today. Um. Yeah, I, again, I've only played the opening of Dragon Age 2, so that wasn't a comment specific to the Dragon Age 2 that shipped. That was specific to what was being discussed internally about what Dragon Age 2 might be while we were still working on Dragon Age Origins. Um, and uh, Bioware was getting very excited about Mass Effect. Um, yeah, that game and, really took off, right? Right, and, and there was definitely a lot of talk that maybe all future games need to be like Mass Effect. Um, which, while I enjoyed it, I didn't feel that's where Bioware's true strength was at the time. Um, I think we had a lot of really capable team members who were really good at making the full party-based control tactical combat type of game. Um, and that even some of the storytelling that we were best at worked better in that more party-based system as opposed to you know, the more action-oriented Mass Effect. Again, really like Mass Effect, um, but I didn't want every game that Bioware made to be Mass Effect with swords. Um, <laughs> Mass and, Effect with swords. <laughs> right, and that was a little bit of the internal conversation about what Dragon Age 2 might be at that time. Hmm. Um, um, and, and I knew for sure it'd be a fully voiced player character, which bugged me a bit. I, I admit I'm less bugged by it now in games, but it did bug me a bit. Um, and I knew it would be hard It'd be hard to make it in a reasonable time frame, right? So kudos to that team for doing it um, because I knew that it would give them very little chance to really polish and refine mm -hmm. gameplay, right? To, especially with everything being voiced and all that, like that's, that's a hard game to make. Um, and I wanted to make sure um, the game should be fun, but working on the game should be fun for me as well. And I knew that it'd be harder for me to have fun making that type of game at that point in time. Um, cause you know, it's not super fun coordinating voice over schedules and budgets and telling writers that, nope, you can't change that line of dialogue that you wrote a year ago. Um, it seems like a really big deal <laughs> to me. I, I think you're right. This, you know, I hadn't really thought about it before. You know, this, just having that voice protagonist, how yeah. big of an issue that is. Yeah, it definitely is. And I think they have some tricks internally at Bioware to, to mitigate it, but, um, it is a huge cost and, and it has impact. It has impact on the choice and the freedom and even what the team members get to contribute to the game, right? Like you can't just drop in a cool little plot without going through several layers of discussion and make sure you think of it a year and a half, right? Like I know Baldur's Gate never winter, right? I'd be playing somebody else's content and go, oh my gosh, if we only added this to it. And then we went and added it. Yeah, and <laughs> right? it's a lot can't... of those little things like that are what makes those games so great, you know? And you can't do that as much. All right, a couple last questions. Hey. <laughs> this is from Cody Sharp, and I think you'll like this. So he says, hey, man, I'd love to know which of the game build processes was fastest and which was his favorite. And do those two qualities, speed and enjoyability of the build process, have a causative or correlated effect? <laughs> oh, my God. So by build processes, what type of build is he implying? Like building the game or building your character? 
That's a good question. <laughs> I could read that both ways. Why don't we um, hear both ways? Dude? Right. Well, initially, I, I thought maybe he's talking about like like how you develop the game, right? So so that's terminology in the game industry, right? Like you're, you're doing your build, right? You're putting all your content, you're doing a build, you're going to test that build. Um, the uh, Bioware games got better and better at that, right? Where you could um, be updating things kind of more closer and closer to real time. Mm-hmm. I think Dragon Age was the best at that. In the games that I worked on, Dragon Age, if I'm remembering correctly, uh, there may be former team members who, <laughs> who will watch this and chime in and say, no, you're remembering it wrong, Brett. Um, but uh, I, I know in some projects, uh, you might make all your content. You might do your content change, and you might even have to wait like a day or two mm-hmm. to be able to fire it up and see it with everybody else's stuff to see a test you make. And the problem with that is um, it's really hard to uh, do something iteratively. Right, like, oh, made a mistake, oh, made a mistake, right? Like, oh, you got to wait two days to find out you made a mistake or, or two days to find out like that wasn't fun. So I always push for the engines to be as live as possible so that you could just be sitting there updating your stuff um, and, and, testing, and testing it out immediately. And I think Dragon Age was much better at that than some of the past games. And I've heard horror stories at other companies where, like, it's a week, it's two weeks to see an integrated. Two weeks, wow. Um, and, at, and at that point, it's really hard to... Um, I don't know to be passionate about what you're doing. Like I don't, I have, I have a hard time working on that. I'm very much um, as a programmer, I'm iterative. Like I'm constantly writing, testing, writing, testing, writing, testing. I don't want to go two days writing, 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 and then see it doesn't run. Right? Like I, I want something running from day one, and me adding to it. Um, and that's a harder pipeline to build um, at a game development studio, but it's one that I definitely encourage. Um, you should be seeing all your bad UI in from like as soon as possible, able to click everything. Neverwinter Nights was challenging in the early days because I didn't have the tool set. So to populate an area, I had to type a text file. And I certainly got annoyed and frustrated with that. I was like, hey, give me more tools, give me more tools. So yeah, the more you can do that, the more it allows your um, artists and designers to, to put content into the game fast and get excited about it and not forget like, oh, I did that. <laughs> Two weeks ago. <laughs> Whatever, I'm onto something else now. Um, and then I'm not sure about if I was to frame it, I don't know if I can answer the question framed differently, like character build, like if it was a character build question. I'm not, because uh, I could see that as like, did I prefer building a second edition character versus a Dragon Age um, character? And again, Dragon Age, I love the origin story idea. I love that part of my character development came out of that custom story I got to play at the beginning of it. Um, that said, I, I love making D&D characters. So I could sit in Baldur's Gate 2 and just roll up character after character after character that's fun as well yeah, i remember playing when i was playing ice with bill not too long ago i'm thinking you know i've probably spent two hours just making my party <laughs> and i don't have any problems with that at all <laughs> i noticed my kids do that with pen and paper they have like each of them has 15 characters mm-hmm. 13 of them aren't in any campaign they're just made for fun so yeah that, that can be fun just trying to figure out all the different abilities that you'd put together and class and race combination and, and all that kind of stuff. And I think Dragon Age had enough of that mm-hmm. still present in it to make that part of the game fun too. All right, so here's the last question I got for you. Okay. <laughs> 21. Uh, so you said in the past that Dragon Age was never meant to be Baldur's Gate 3. Right. Right, It's uh, yeah, that's pretty clear. So what I'm wondering though is... What would Baldur's Gate 3 have looked like uh, from your perspective and if you had total control over it? Well, and that's really tough because I don't think at any point I could say I was like the uh, the holder of the Baldur's Gate vision. Um, I, I wasn't involved in um, the Throne of Ball stuff, right? Mm-hmm. So like the, 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 the wrap-up. Um, uh, it definitely, whatever, it, it needs party control. Like a, a Baldur's Gate 3 without party control of at least... I'd say four people. <laughs> it's gotta be um, six. <laughs> I, I think would be a a problem, right? Like it certainly cannot be a, a first person shooterist experience. I think that would be crazy. Um, it'd have to have tactical combat. It'd have to have enough complication in the combat to be interesting, right? Um, spells having various effects on other spells depending on circumstance, right? I think there have to be a layer of nuance to the combat system to make it fun. Um, um, I think it could, could do more with the party members than the original Baldur's Gates did. In terms of story, though, I'd have a hard time figuring out how to fit the story, right? Because the main plot wrapped up, 
right? So I think that would be a challenge to anybody trying to make a Baldur's Gate 3. Is... Now, would you want to have multiple origin stories in this? Maybe. I, I mean, maybe that would be an interesting way of taking it, right? Because you, um, you could have multiple origin stories based on if you wanted to tie it back to the previous games, right? You can mm -hmm. maybe, maybe, well, can we know these people ended it this way, these people ended it this way, these people ended it that way. Those could be three origin stories into the game to allow a little bit of, and then you would probably have to railroad them into <laughs> whatever the core plot is, but they at least have that opening. I'm different. Um, but I'd have a hard time continuing the storyline. I think somebody really creative would have to come up with a way to, uh, um, if you wanted to have that connection, right, to the whole ball spawn and, and all of that. I think that um, you could maybe deviate from that and just focus on the city, right? Bring it back to, to the city and then the events of the past games um, having influence on that. Um, one of the things I did on Baldur's Gate 2, which probably not even note it, there's a scene where you accomplish a plot and you get statues made of yourself. Um, and I can only remember the plot. That's just a trick meter or something like that but it was somebody else's plot and i went in and i was like well yeah the reward's okay but there should be more of a reward and so we figured out how to we use um the petrify right the the flesh to stone to to make statues out of the party and duplicate them and leave statues so i've always liked the idea that some games could maybe get away with taking your previous save file mm -hmm. and just changing the world like statues in different places uh, names of buildings differently a few of the history books being written differently um as more of a subtle layer of world influencing really cool. yeah um, so i probably pitched that on every single game i worked on at bioware i don't think we incorporated it into any sequel of anything but i always love that idea of uh of um, that permanent change to the architecture or whatever right it doesn't really rely on um the story having to um, be written to just for stuff, right? There's oh, there's a statue of my character from before, and and that's the continuation. Um, so yeah, I do a lot of thinking around those. I I would try to figure out some way to pay respect to the previous two games, mm -hmm. even if I had to reboot the storyline um, and go in a different direction. Well, I hope you get that chance. <laughs> <laughs> well, Brent, thanks so much. I mean, this has been awesome. I really appreciate you taking the time. To... Well, I appreciate the opportunity. It was kind of cool to rehash oh, sure. um, the, the past and try to remember things I haven't thought about in a very long time. So, Is there anything that you wanted to get to that we didn't cover? No, I think, I think I'm pretty good. Um, uh, I appreciate the, you know, talking about the, the game design books. I'd mm -hmm. love to get um, updated versions of them out sometime. Again, time constraints, but um, um, anybody who has purchased them, uh, um, uh, Kindle does automatic updating, but the ones that people buy direct, I, I email people and I say, hey, I got a new version. Um, so one day expect to see a version with some of my Beamdog experiences mm -hmm. in, in incorporated into the text and even some of my new um, experiences at the technical college I'm working at. I'm I'm now learning things that I I kind of wish I had known a long time ago. Um, I'm learning. You're, you're uh, learning stuff. Wow. I'm learning stuff still. Yeah, for sure. Like, I, like I'm not teaching or anything, right? We're in research capacity, so I'm learning. Like, how can you take an old game and use machine learning to upres all of the textures, um, and and things like that? So playing around with them. Um, I don't. I'd love to figure out how to make games more cheaply. Run, run, run that by me again, if you don't. What are you doing? Well, this actually came from a post from a former coworker. He had taken a machine learning solution. Okay. And see, there's a whole community built around this, so it wasn't just him. But I dived into this community. They take old games, which have small like how, textures. How old are we talking about? Here? Like, let's say the the, the Quest games okay. are um, the game. He was doing one of the old TSR um, D and D games, I think. Uh, he did an experiment. He took the old text textures. And he was able to upsize them um, so that they would play well on a larger resolution modern day screen without mm. needing an artist to redo them. Um, and so I've played around with this process as well, and I barely know how to do it properly. But yeah, it works. Um, and this is a technology that will grow and grow. And so it really sounds like it's got some incredible potential. Yeah, if you search, there's a community. One of my coworkers also got excited when I mentioned this and went digging. And there's a whole community around taking the old games and and um, increasing the resolution of their textures. Um, I think a lot of them are stuck on like, well, then when now what? How do I? take somebody else's game yeah, and beam dog's gonna want you back when you learn all this stuff <laughs> yeah that's I, I i'm probably gonna talk about enhanced edition a few emails because i i do think maybe had they known 
some of this stuff there maybe or maybe there are opportunities to do things a little more cheaply because the art is really expensive yeah. right to, to have somebody go through and just redo everything i know the ui for the neverwinter night enhanced edition was a huge cost i, I know the resolutions just like the resolution changes oh, okay it's there but like that was such a huge cost and that mm-hmm. took away from doing other things so yeah we might see a resurgence of maybe community hosted old games or companies like Beamdog able to maybe do a bit more. Um, yeah, so machine learning has some promising features. And even for new games, I think artists would be well inclined to uh, learn how to use this as a tool. Like not see it as a threat, <laughs> but, but see it as a tool. Like I can maybe do less work and generate more by using some of these solutions that are up and coming. Mm. Um, you can, uh, I, I've seen machine learning solutions that allow you to concept right? Like you do one room, you press a button and it shows it in like a bunch of different colors and slightly different furniture arrangement, right? And so as a concept artist, you could take that to your boss and say, yeah, look what I got done. I got, I could give you 13 examples of what this, uh, this dungeon could look like, but you only did the work of one. So um, that stuff might enable indie it developers. Like it'd be useful for architects and like designers. And-, and I think it is being used in those domains for sure mm-hmm. at this point in time. So yeah, I'm learning. One day, maybe. We'll, uh, <laughs> we'll back into the game ecosystem. I definitely would like to influence the local one here. I think we have some tricks and tools that um, uh, this Edmonton region um, is growing with more video game companies. You know, people do leave Bioware, start new companies, join other companies. So we're starting to get an ecosystem of game developers here. And um, some of them are smaller. And I'm excited to see what games they might make. Well, some of you younger guys or people looking to re. Uh... Yeah, you know, reskill or whatever. Maybe move to Edmonton. <laughs> yeah, no, for sure. Um, and in general, I don't post often online, but I'm totally open to questions. Like if people, like I do, occasionally get new game designers ask me for advice. I'm always open to th- like, reply to my books email. already. Buy <laughs> 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 my <laughs> pages. <laughs> I always reply to email and, and all of that. Uh, I know the books can be daunting sometimes. To I think people, we live in a world of video now, right? Maybe I should make a video version of it at some point. But um, I'm always willing to give advice to anybody. Hmm. All right, Brent. Well, thanks uh, again. Yeah, I really Fantastic. appreciate it. Fantastic, awesome. Glad to meet you. Yeah, nice Your to meet you too. First person from Bioware I've had on the show after all these years is kind of oh, amazing. That's, yeah, it's crazy because yeah, there's a lot of us floating around there. I know, um, but maybe they're all busy. I remember I talked to Ray one time. You know, oh, he, did, cool. he just said he was done. He's like he doesn't want to do any interviews or yeah, yeah. He's I haven't just talked. Retired now. You know, keep off the <laughs> get off my lawn, kid. <laughs> I'm and, kind and of exaggerating of that a little bit, but I mean, it was he polite. has a lot of demand for his time as well. Like he yeah. he does a lot of like he's kind of moved into a, a different realm of um, like entrepreneurship and stuff like that. And I think he's a, just a very busy. Busy guy, and he's enjoying his time off too. Like he travels a lot, so I get it's to been see some years. Travel. Maybe his chance is uh, maybe yeah, he's been yeah. Away long enough so I could try him again. Is there other yeah. are there other people you think I should totally well, talk to? I don't know. Maybe offline, I could think about it. I don't know. I, I know a lot. A lot of people like me have kind of like moved out of the industry, right? And some of them moved out a long time ago and are firmly out of it. And then there's other people I've trained who are kind of all over the place at different game companies, which is kind of cool. Mm-hmm. But like, I, I know I have coworkers at Blizzard um, uh, and uh, um, uh, Respawn Entertainment and just all over the place. So it's kind of kind of exciting for me. But I, I don't know how talkative any of them are. Um, <laughs> um, if there's ever any names, you could maybe let me know. Um, I know I try to reach out to the Bioware people who are still at Bioware, mm-hmm. and they're always so busy. I'm like, hey, do you want to go out for lunch or whatever? And uh, it's just they're just busy, busy, busy people. So, um, but yeah, if you have a few names, I could, I could let you know the likelihood <laughs> of, <laughs> of 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 them agreeing or not. Um, uh, and I know many of us were always a lot more comfortable behind the camera too, right? Like, like a lot of us didn't do interviews and being on the screen. We're we're introverts and. <laughs> and don't want maybe uh the, you know that that shyness factor or whatever right but there's a few people i could probably chat with who might be interested um if, especially if you have names so um but anybody in, the, in anybody in the industry is usually so busy that stuff like this is hard i think for them to, well, to so i guess to that's a good problem to have yeah no no for sure um but yeah there might be a couple people out there all right, Brent. Well, thanks uh, again. One <laughs> final thing. I'll let you get on with your day. 
Uh, thanks hey, so uh, much for this, though, and I'll I should be posting this probably this weekend. So if you wanted to watch it, okay, I'll, awesome. I'll post, definitely post links to your books and. Uh, cool, I really appreciate that. Um, anything else yeah. you wanted me to mention or post links to? No, or? no. I'm in that weird phase of my life where I don't have anything I'm promoting or anything, so it's just. <laughs> <laughs> encourage people to ask me questions that's about it and uh you know i'm, I'm here as a uh, mentor resource now i think more so than anything in the industry so well you probably won't. you probably will get a few questions coming your way then so oh sounds good okay have a great, have a great rest of the day you too okay bye man that's all for this week's episode i hope you guys enjoyed that it was a lot of fun for me chatting uh, with Brent. Uh, I can assure you that. I mean, this guy is really just incredible. And I hope you will uh, check out his books. Uh, they're very reasonably priced, and you can get those just like that off his website. So check the, uh, show, uh, the show notes for the links to that. Uh, as always, I want to thank you uh, very, very much. You are the one, uh, the ones who make this show possible. If you like this interview with uh, Brent, want to see more like it, or just want to uh, you know, thank me for the work that went into this, uh, please go to that link on the show notes to the Patreon site. All I ask is a one buck per episode. Uh, you know, so uh, It's not too much money. Of course, if you want to put in more than that, uh, I really appreciate that too. Uh, but anything you guys do, uh, any amount of uh, support, if you're tweeting about the episodes, telling your friends about it on Facebook, whatever it is you do to support Mad Chat, I really appreciate it, and thank you, thank you. Uh, very, very much. I did want to say a quick uh, shout out to some of my new patrons. Uh, we have uh, some new patrons. Cody, uh, thank you, Mr. Cody. We've got Spin Flight, Pablo, Benjamin, and Nick. I believe those are all of them. Oh, Andre. <laughs> uh, so those are some, uh, you know, some of your fellow uh, Matt Chatters who stepped up to the plate to support the show. Uh, on Patreon. Uh, Patreon. Uh, so thank you uh, to all of them, as well as the existing members. Uh, please keep that uh, support coming. I really, really appreciate it. So thank you. All right. So what about that news from the Matt Cave? Boy, what have we got? You know, and you have noticed I've been doing these longer episodes lately, so yeah, I, th I think I'll m mention that because if, uh, you know, some people say they don't want to, or they can't really afford to support the show if it's going to be coming out once a week. Uh, so if that's kind of the thing that's been holding you back, I don't, you know, you can rest assured I'm not going to be churning out <laughs> two and a half hour uh, long episodes every week. Probably be more like once a month. Uh, so if that works better for you, uh, you could just uh, adjust your Patreon Patreon account accordingly. All right, anyway, uh, here's some uh, really good news. Uh, my new book, uh, the one I, I co-authored with uh, Shane Stacks of A Shane Plays, also has a great uh, YouTube channel, radio show. If you like games and all things geek, go check out Shane's stuff. <laughs> but anyway, uh, we're both psyched because our book has come out on May 12th. Just a few, uh, what is that? Is that even a week away, maybe two weeks I don't have a calendar in front of me, uh, but it's available for pre-order right now. It's $59.95. You can get that from Amazon, or you can get it directly from the CRC Press's website. You know, whatever's more convenient to you. Now, I know some of you guys already have the first edition. Uh, it's still, by the way, $37 if you try to get a used copy of that. But this new one just kind of blows it out of the water. It's got full-color images. That's one of the big problems with the previous version. You know, as much, as, much work as went into that... Uh, the screenshots were kind of lame, kind of these uh, little grayscale black and white images, hard to see. Well, that's gone. <laughs> it's, it's full color. I think it's uh, close to like 200 more pages, uh, too. Uh, reorganized, you know, brought up to date with all the, later, all the latest games in there. A lot of the, the material from Matt Chat's actually in there. I mean, it's just a shame putting in a lot of uh, humorous stuff. Uh, I mean, it's really just an incredible book. I really hope you will buy that. Uh, some people have been asking me about signed copies you know, I, usually the way I think, uh, I don't get a lot of free copies as an author, unfortunately. Uh, so probably the best thing to do would be to, uh, you know, if you want to do that, let's wait till the book comes out. And what, what I usually get people to do is buy it on Amazon, have it sent to me, 
and then I'll figure out how to send it to you. It's usually not too bad as long as you're uh, in the U.S. Now, if you're overseas, this gets a little more complicated, but, you know, if it's something you're really interested in, uh, just get in touch with me. We'll, we'll, we'll figure something out. All right, let's put it that way. Because <laughs> I just really want you to have a copy of the book. Uh, that's the main thing. Uh, all right, other news. Uh, we've got a uh, story by ONS Good for Polygon. I thought this was fun. Uh, he's writing about the World Video Game Hall of Fame inducting some more honorees. I didn't even know there was a World Video Game Hall of Fame, but, but there it is. But this is the game they want to put in. It's probably not what you would think. It's 1990's Microsoft Solitaire, that pack-in game that came with the Windows 3.0. They say it became ubiquitous around the world. Over a bi distributed on over a billion computers, 35 billion games per year, over 200 markets. I mean, that's just really incredible. And, you know, I remember back when this came out, I remember seeing people playing uh, the Solitaire. It seemed to be on everybody's computer. Uh, I can remember people getting kind of crazy with it. You know, to me, it's the kind of game you might play for half an hour. Uh, but I had friends that would play that thing all night long. I mean, they just got totally addicted. Uh, I don't know. It's not a game I normally think a lot about, Microsoft Solitaire. Uh, but, you know, I like to hear your stories. Are you one of those people that played this game? Maybe you still play it you know, off and on. Some people tell me it's very relaxing to them to play this. Uh, but anyway, yeah, they got into the Hall of Fame. They're also inducting uh, Mortal Kombat. <laughs> which is, it's like, it, it's, what a world that, that Mortal Kombat and Solitaire would be in the same uh, event. And also Super Mario Kart. So three very different kind of games. I guess uh, those came out in 1992. And let's see, I don't know when Solitaire, Microsoft Solitaire came out in the 1990s. Uh, anyway, wow. Uh, and then there's another article of interest. There is, um, well, let's see, Matt Perez or Matt, Matt Perez and Nathan Vardy of Forbes have written this article called the. It's an exclusive article called "The Saga of Star Citizen," a video game that raised three hundred million dollars but na may never be ready to play. So they really kind of give us a nice expose. You know, it seems like a Star Citizen. I was so excited about this when I first heard about it. Uh, but I've kind of gotten very cynical uh, about it. I don't, I'm kind of thinking it probably will never show up, but apparently a lot of other people are still really pumped. They're still buying these uh, ships for it <laughs> to, to, to the tune of thousands of dollars to uh, get these uh, special ships. Uh, this article gets pretty cynical about it, though. Uh, they talk about how uh, Roberts has enticed gamers, quote-unquote, with a steady stream of hype, including a vast playable universe with a hundred star systems but <laughs> most of the money is gone and the game is still far from finished uh, so they talk about how he's gone through his uh, budget hasn't really got a lot to show for it <laughs> but they say this is not fraud uh, roberts really is working on the game but it is incompetence and mismanagement on a galactic scale the heedless waste is fueled by easy money raised through crowdfunding a Wild West territory nearly free of regulators and rules. So I'd like to hear from you guys. I know some of you are Star Citizen fans. You know, you are uh, optimistic about it. <laughs> you know, I don't know if I have any if any viewers. You know, if any of you guys have plunked down the thousands to get one of these ships, <laughs> I'd especially like to hear from you. <laughs> you know, what what do you think is going on with uh, Roberts? Uh, but anyway, I just... I. I you know, I kind of hate to see articles like this. I really wish Roberts, I, I really wish the game would come out so I could play it and it would it would live up to the expectations. But, you know, sometimes it is what it is. Now, all right, let's wrap this up with a quotation then. And I was looking up for quotes about management and planning and things, things like that because we talked to, you know, Brett talked a lot about these topics. And I found a quote here that I, I really like by Tom DeMarco. And I'm pretty sure Brent would agree with this. I don't know, maybe we could, maybe we could ask him. Or when he watches this video, he can chime in. Uh, but it goes something like this. Get the right people. Then, no matter what else you might do wrong after that, the people will save you. That's what management is all about. So ponder on that, and see you guys next time.
something to be proud of me. Just once. And now... Wow! The stuff has been pumped and now I'm hungry. Hey, there you are! <laughs> hey, man, I'm so hungry, I just have to eat! Grimstarch died. I prefer chicken. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>